We are live. Take it away, Floyd. So what 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 inspired this conversation? Why don't you start there? So um really it's just, you know, I, I've always wanted to kind of like I think I've talked to you, Peter, about trying to get out here and, and have more discussions, open discussions related to just cannabis breeding um, and, you know, uh, the hemp industry and kind of just for the most part, I've kind of sat in the back um, and I see a lot of information, you know, getting out there online and, and generally I don't uh, interact, but, uh, but Colin's always posting, you know, good information and kind of provocative information. And he had a post the other day um, with the, the question, you know, is, is breeding too easy or is cannabis breeding too easy? And, and I was like, wow, you know, like, it actually engaged me and, you know, I, I you know, we kind of went back and forth and I was like, well, um, Peter's kind of offered this platform, um, you know, to us. Why don't we just, you know, and it's really hard to have a open discussion on online, like in, in text. And so I figured why not bring it to the future cannabis project so others could kind of um, hear us, you know, discuss. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's one of those questions where, you know, you could ask a hundred different people, a hundred different breeders and you'd get, a, you know, a hundred different answers. And so I think with uh, Colin's kind of technical background and, and uh, you know, I think he can kind of go into his, you know, uh, knowledge and expertise, but, uh, but yeah, essentially that, that's what it was. It was, it was a post that he had kind of made and, uh, and it kind of spurred, spurred some interest in me. And then it just happened that, you know, we had reconnected and, uh, um, and you had offered, you know, to, uh, to do podcasts kind of whenever, you know, I, I had the opportunity or whenever I could kind of rope people in. And so I jumped it, on it. it. Is this the post? Is breeding yeah. too easy? Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. So yeah. So Colin, Colin, explain yourself. That's a, <laughs> yeah. A very so, inflammatory uh, comment. A, a lot of, and, and I guess that question is double sided because both I think I could agree with yes, it is, and then the flip side. Um, but yeah, like Floyd said, I tend to do a lot of things. I think campus culture has this this knowledge base, and and I try to bring some practicality to a lot of what I do and what I talk about and in, in my greenhouse, what I kind of apply. And so, uh, and a lot of things I do and whether it's the bro science or I chase certain topics and I say, you know, how well does that actually work? Whether it's common knowledge in, in the industry and, and just try and put some technical terms to a lot of the stuff. And, and I've known Floyd for, um, you know, a few years at least now through, you know, running his genetics. And then I think we've seen each other at some shows here and there. And yeah. so it was, it's a good conversation and it's a good place to talk about the stuff a little bit more. And so I'm always open for that opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I, and- I was just trying to make sure everyone could read uh, the whole thing, but uh, go, go for it. Yeah. Keep I, talking. I I'm just showing this. Che- checking out uh, Colin's Instagram page. Cause it, it's loaded with information. I think you can, anybody can gain um, a lot of, in, you know, knowledge from, uh, from what he's got going on. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I think this is, you know, I just wanted this to be kind of open-ended. I mean, we could take it anywhere really. I mean, you can, you know, kind of peel back the onion and, and approach the, that topic from a bunch of different ways. But first off, I, I definitely wanted to kind of go into, you know, Colin's background and have him just kind of share like his expertise, what, you know, where he's coming from. I know he's, they do, you know, greenhouse systems. He's got, um, background and you know hop hop and, and maybe you know some of your breeding experience whether it's in uh cannabis or uh um, other you know crops and then say you know vice versa i can kind of just do a little background on me so people have context to where we're coming from um so yeah for sure you take it away yeah so yeah i guess i'll give a little breath background on myself and then i'll kind of explain the context of that, that post um some of those are kind of clickbait ideas or titles uh, with some thought behind them. So, so I've been doing controlled environment ag culture for oh, I know, a few decades now. Um, cannabis grower, kind of originally, always, you know, some from the '90s, I guess you can say, going forward. Um, and then I took a phase where I really wanted to get the educational side of it. So I went to school, got my degree from University of Arizona, and then moved to Colorado. Did a lot of plant research at Colorado State University with tomatoes and hops, uh, and then hemp as well. And then went to work with Mammoth P or Grossentia for quite a while. And we formulated a lot of the trials and stuff for Mammoth P in my greenhouse here. And so on the farm here, I've got 5,000 square foot greenhouse. And then we've got about 65 acres um, of soil production that we usually run for trials. Um, but yeah, originally I came back to Colorado for hops. We did one of the first hydroponic hop greenhouses. And 
ran that for a while and then the hot market you know wasn't as strong it was kind of like i guess the hemp market the last few years it was this big boom for a while and then it kind of settled and then i worked through or with crop king and through crop king you know i do a lot of consultation but a lot of research-based trials and things that we've been doing here and through crop king we sell greenhouses um supplies we have engineers on house so it's kind of a broad spectrum you know everything from we can build you a greenhouse to supply nutrients and things like that um yeah so- it, it's it's just quickly there it's actually funny because when floyd was first like this guy calling from crop king i was like crap king the seed company yeah, the seed and company. he's like no no different crop king yeah no I, I remember getting going to some trade shows i think i don't know what it was a i forget one of the canicons i think it was oklahoma and there was this big hype of or you know some of the shady things crop king seeds have done and then everyone's like, oh, Colin, he's here. And so people come up to me and I'm like, whoa, whoa, distinction. There's there's a separation, not the same company. So and we've gotten into like trying to battle the name, but they're a Canadian company. So it's just like, yeah, we're far enough away that most people. But yeah, no, I do get that a lot. So no affiliation to Crop King Seeds by any means. Yeah, um, I, I thought that was important to clarify for everyone watching. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. I get a lot of instant turnoffs from that. I think I had the same idea when I first came, you know, crossed it, uh, your name a couple years back. So, yeah. But with a little bit of digging, you kind of know there's there's some separation. Or, yeah. And I think, um, haven't they like changed it. to like Rocket Seeds now? Or are they still? I think they kind of um, change their seed names every couple of years. But I know they've been sense. advertising as Rocket Seeds. They probably yeah. sell under a bunch of different names. Yeah. <laughs> True. So I, I guess the basis behind that post the other day is in, in you know, and I have experience in other crops like hops and and tomatoes more traditional agriculture and so understanding the breeding that goes on in that versus kind of the cannabis scene and so with commercial agriculture and with tomatoes hops any of that kind of stuff breeding is a very long process you know it's seven eight nine years to get these new cultivars out and and so it takes a lot of labor to get to that point and so then with cannabis, it's more of, you know, a lot of these polyhybrid just crosses. And so you see the flood of these crosses. And, and so that that aspect of breeding is kind of what I coined, you know, is that too easy? Because a lot of people can do that, create these these new cultivars. And so my challenge in that post was, is that true breeding? And I think if you're looking from a botanical sense, that doesn't fall into that line of true breeding. Or if you talk about uh, pure breeding or pure lines. It's definitely not that. But I'm also in the same hand, I'm not trying to knock that that's kind of where cannabis has come. It's created some really cool hybrids and some really cool varieties that we see out there. But it, it lacks the stability. Um, and I think as it goes from underground to more commercial, where you're going to need to rely on you know, larger genetics and these inbred lines, I think it's going to become more important. Um, but in the past it's, it's worked well. You could buy a handful of seeds and, you know, you get some really cool stuff. You can get some interesting stuff and it, it doesn't matter, but now legalization, we're starting to see a need for that. What, yeah, what I think some, for, for you would something, I mean, I, I think of kind of uniformity. So like if someone popped hundreds of your seeds and I'm thinking from a, like, if I'm, selling seeds to a commercial operator in California or Colorado or wherever, and then kind of the intent behind that project, which was, you know, maybe it was great flavor and powdery mildew resistance or, you know, wh- whatever the, or like old school genetics with like short flowering, t- like commercial flowering time, uh, you know, finishing capabilities or something like that. Whereas the other is kind of like, I got a pack of something from some breeder and I quickly crossed it to something else. And four months later, I am now selling that. Uh, And if someone grows it out, they're going to, they, they may get a lot of cool stuff, but it's more like about the fee for, for that person who bought that pack, it'd be more about the pheno hunting and the fun rather than being able to rely on those 12 seeds or 200 seeds to, to give me something very consistent and Correct. is that kind of yeah i mean i think you're spot on and that's kind of i think where we are right now and and when it comes to you know getting these homogenous genetic lines 
and you know you're right it's and so and i guess here's a story back you know when i first started working with thomas with high alpine genetics is a few i don't know what three four five how long years that we've been doing this um but i remember i think i bought all of his runs because again i'm coming from at least on the commercial side of it hops and these large scale traditional agriculture methods so i contacted thomas and i'm like i want 12 of your cultivars and i want to fill my greenhouse i'm going to do this first year as a trial run see which ones work well and then i'm going to go big on those next year and so i did that i ran 12 and that's back i think it was like terp town abracadabra um it was his hot sauce kind of line and so i ran a greenhouse full of them i picked the ones i want and i think it was abracadabra and terp town i really liked and i so i chose those I, you know a few phenotypes just really good flower so I was excited and then I went back to Thomas. I was like, all right, man, I want, you know, 2000 seeds of these. I want 3000 seeds of those. And he's like, oh, we don't, you know, I'm not doing those anymore. And he was on to the next thing. And that's kind of when I realized, oh, okay. All right. So it's more of, you know, this creating these strains and then, you know, you got to kind of do the groundwork to create that. And so that's where my, I kind of shifted in what I was looking for in genetics. And, and again, you know, you have the growers have to do a lot of the groundwork in some of these, these genetics where, so you can create this this cool f1 and you know and i guess we could hop into terminology and you know you get with f1 you get this what are the heterosis or the hybrid vigor but that is only if you're coming from pure lines and most most breeders and, and obviously i'll let floyd talk more about this as he's more involved in that side of it but most breeders aren't breeding from pure lines there's just really not that many out there so a lot of these you're not getting that f1 vigor that you should be getting and you're just getting these crosses of crosses. And so it's hard to track and you can do, you know, dehybrid dehybridization, which is harder in a dioecious plant, but you can do things that like single this out, but to circle back. Yeah. It's like, and for me specifically, uh, we deal with farms and I want to grow from seed. I love seed. I love the structure, the morphology. I love going from seed. It's easier. But if I have a farm that says, Hey, I want to do this Bay 3000 plants, from seed, I want them looking the same. You know, it's like a Coca-Cola. If you buy a Coca-Cola, you want it to be the same everywhere you go. And and you kind of want that in a genetic line. So when you do that, you you plant these 2000 seeds, you could have, you know, half of them or this or that. And, and so it's really hard to n nail it down, which is why, you know, people run clones. But, but yeah, I mean, I'll let Floyd jump in. I don't want to chat this whole time, but there's a, there's no. a jump start. Yeah, I mean, I think you make a good distinction between like production lines of farmers that kind of want uniformity. And I think there's there's plenty of breeders out there that kind of um, are doing just that, you know, I mean, probably the biggest one, you know, we can name is Oregon CBD, right? They came out of the gate right. uh, with true F1s, like using, you know, inbred photo and auto lines and then creating early seasons, right? So they're kind of like um, the standard. But then we also have to look at, you know, prohibition. I mean, the cannabis industry, well, you know, cannabis industry, I mean, if we're talking hemp industry right now, you know, 2018, the farm bill kind of passed. 2019 was the first year that, you know, um, the country came online. And so, I mean, you're talking about a very small gene pool of genetics, you know, so, I mean, you're, there's no way, I mean, there, there, you know, potentially people had been breeding, you know, for years, maybe fo focusing on CBD. Um, so you have to kind of take into account the beginning of an industry and the amount of time that it, it takes to create, you know, kind of stable lines, like you said. Um, and then, so I, and I think, you know, even like with Thomas, I mean, a lot of times we're starting with these genetics that may not be the best. And within a couple of years, I mean, we've made leaps and bounds. Um, oh, for sure. So I think there is a place, you know, for like, like you said, you know, these, these uh, uniform production lines um, for big farms. And I think that will always be, and I think, I think the hemp, hemp industry will stand as a, you know, kind of a role model or a format for the future of the cannabis industry as it's legalized around the world and throughout our country. Um, it's going to look more like, you know, um, conventional ag on a, on a bigger scale. Um, but, you know, I, I think, so there's always going to be a place for that, but that, you know, that doesn't discount the fact that, like you said, the uh the barrier to entry of as far as like making seed right i mean anybody can kind of throw you know throw two plants together uh and create something new um but that doesn't necessarily you know mean that you're going to break into the market as a uh you know as, as a commercial or a successful breeder 
Um, I think there's, you know, as far as the barrier to entry into like doing it for a living, you know, that next step requires, you know, years of work and kind of like, you know, validation through, you know, customer support. Um, and so I think, you know, and I, and I think it's important as a breeder probably to have your inbred stable lines for production, but then never stop creating new lines because there is going to be a demand for home growers or, uh, you know, even commercial farms that, you know, like especially indoor cultivation, it's always, you know, kind of been toward clone, you know, clone only. I mean, as far as like uniform, homogenous, um, you know, production. And I, and I think they take that into account. Um, and so, I mean, in, in then kind of pulling from the cannabis side, you know, you have certain strains that have stuck around for years in clone form, which, you know, you could have breeders that have maybe an incentive to create like a true breeding line from it and try to, you know, replicate that clone. Um, but even then, you know, the, you know, what is the incentive? I mean, are you going to operate, you know, are you going to develop these lines without making a profit for, you know, six, seven years? So, I mean, you, and I, and I think, you know, from coming from a breeder, like from kind of my perspective, um, you know, seed production and breeding is, is, is my passion, but it, it's only a portion of our, our income. You know, if I, I could not survive just on seed sales alone. So I think there's something to be said for that too. So as we transition, you know, and grow as breeders and the industry grows, I think the goal will always be like, um, like Colin had, you know, it said is like, like that is kind of the like ideal, right. Is to create your, these, uh, you know, production lines for farmers, but then also having, you know, kind of um, poly hybrids and diversity that you can then, you know, draw from because that's, you know, that's kind of like your, you know, your tool set, right? Like, um, and, and as a breeder too, there's something to be said for uh, variety, like it's, it's the spice of life, you know, but, but yeah, I mean, I, I think there, you know, there's a lot of seed breeders out there um, and, and they all serve a role, but it's like, who's going to be around, you know, in 10, 20 years, I think will be the ultimate test, right? You got to, you, in, in many ways, the market decides, who, who ends up being successful or not. Um, yeah. But, no, uh, I, and I agree. And I think when you talk about incentivizing genetics, cause it's like you said, if you know, if you nine years to do one cultivar and in mm-hmm. the culture right now, doesn't like that. Like Oregon CB, yeah. Oregon CBD doesn't have a great rap amongst the culture. Farmers like them. Like I, I tend to really enjoy them because I can plant right. 500 of their seeds and they're spot on. Yep. But they're not popular in the, in the culture and the market season says, oh, super sour space candy. Wow. You know, nobody's impressed yeah. with it. But as, as a farmer, you know, that's kind of what we want to grow. We want to keep those moving. And so then when you say incentivize it, that's where you get into the, you know, like with Monsanto trying to patent right. things. And it makes sense if you're going to spend eight years, nine years putting all of this effort into having this one stock, you need some way yes. of getting your money back. But then in, in cannabis companies and breeders, some breeders are doing this now. They're trying to say, well, how can I monetize? How can I, you know, patent this variety, which is kind of the backlash. Because I think obviously Monsanto kind of has a bad rap for some things they do, rightfully so. But, you know, as far as patenting it, somehow they have to recoup their efforts in doing that. Otherwise, just keep producing these polycrosses and, and send them out there. And so right now the incentive for breeders is keep producing what's popular, you know, mash the newest clones together find something the new flavor push it out there so that's the incentive for breeders to make a living and to be popular and gain popularity and and get those cultivars in the hands of you know famous growers and and then that's kind of how you get these crazy seed lines out there but it's i and again this kind of touches on my post it's not doing much for the integrity of breeding because all these you know kind of poly hybrids out there aren't stable lines they're just kind of further diverging from and you know and and you probably know more than anybody. There's not too many stable indicas or stable sativas that you can find anymore. And and trying to find a true purebred line is hard to find. I mean, I think you can get, you know, like blueberry, and there's some of the classic, uh, you know, the yeah, skunks that you might be able to get hold of. Yeah, sure. There's some of those old varieties, but it, it's hard to find. And so without having those true stocks, and and so my point, I guess, in the post is I don't want to say we don't need these you know, small breeders, we just need big, we need both, but I think we need some more of these, the Oregon CBD type that can look through all of the awesome, you know, crosses that have been made, find some of those and then create some new IBLs. Cause then from those, then you can have some true F ones. Then we get that true F one bigger back. And I think Royal, I just read something a couple weeks ago. I think Royal queen seeds 
they're apparently coming out with their first true F1. It's from apparently two IBL lines that they've been working on. And I think, you know, they go back decades. So, so I think it's going in that direction. And I guess that's the conversation I was trying to spur is like, there's nothing wrong with everybody breeding, but there is a difference between, you know, making these kind of polycrosses versus creating a 10 year IBL line. They're just different styles. And I think, you know, to speak on your IP protection, like, I think that's an important aspect. And, and I don't think many breeders would want to release their IBL lines out to the public at this point, which is why they create these F1s because, right. you know, it's going to take anybody several generations to, you know, to, to back engineer that cross essentially. So it's like, you know, especially with Oregon CBD, you take that to F2 and now you've got autos and you can kind of, it's transparent when you, you grow some these seeds out and there's autos popping up that chances are they, you know, they just took a, you know, a photo by auto hybrid to the next generation. So, um, so I mean, in that, in some ways that is built in IP protection, right? Because you're forcing, right. um, you're basically preventing that breeder from doing, you know, just second generation knockoffs. Yeah. And, and I don't think many breeders would want to release an IBL. I mean, I, I think breeders do have their own IBL lines and they, they specifically use them to make, you know, their own hybrids and release the hybrids. So, sure. I mean, you do see that within the industry and I think knowledgeable breeders have, they, they know that because, you know, and that's why you see a lot of the IBLs that are out there are kind of heirloom varieties, like more of the Burmese or like the, you know, Cushes and some, some of these that we might consider land races or something. Right. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so I mean, in, in, but then, like you said, you also have that cultural backlash where it's like, I'm, you know, and I, and I'm, I'm guilty of it. Like I'm of the mindset of like, um, like I want everybody had to have kind of access to the plant. And, and so I'm, I, I, de- I tend to be more towards that open source kind of side, but it's like, you know, I also, I'm not, you know, I like, I have a, a degree, a, you know, undergraduate in economics. And so I, like, I understand like these companies that put, put all this money into R and D um, you have to recoup that in some way. And, and like I said, the way that our, our society is set up, like those guys will dominate the market eventually. And they have yet to enter the market and I guarantee they already have their own lines that are probably, you know, and they're probably using molecular breeding techniques with markers. They're doing gene editing, you know? So, I mean, they have the technique, the money, the, the power to create completely uniform line, maybe, you know, zero THC, right. Delete the THC. So like, so yeah. like, but, but where I'm coming from is like, there's also going to be, you know, the heirloom guys that will always do kind of conventional um, or like traditional breeding through just like growing things out, selecting, you know, I mean, we do have access to cheap uh, analytics nowadays. So it's like for a hemp breeder, you know, that's invaluable because like we are breeding for specific cannabinoids versus, um, you know, kind of like whatever, you know, effects or looks or, you know, things like that. So, I mean, and, and then, you know, it also brings up like the goals and objectives as a breeder, right? It's like, I think you're where, where you're coming from is from a commercial perspective, but then there's a whole other side of like, the home grower who's just growing for a medicinal or kind of like, you know, their own personal head stash. Um, and in that case, maybe they don't necessarily want, you know, all, all of the same thing. Right. They, they, like right. it goes back to varieties, the spice of life. Um, so yeah, I, I, I see both sides and, and, uh, and I think there's a, a way for a breeder to kind of choose a path and become commercially successful doing either one. But, at the same time, like for me personally, like I have projects that are, you know, we're like for, uh, for example, I have like uh, my original zombie line. It's a CBG by CBD hybrid. You know, we, we took that to F2 and now we're taking it to F3. We'll be separating it into a CBG line and a CBD line. And maybe 10 years later, you know, all th- those will be true bread lines. Yeah. Um, but in the meantime, I'm also doing, you know, poly hybrids and doing land race hybrids or doing preservation projects because it's kind of like, um i just have my interests are broad and it's like i just yeah. love growing the plants so. well and, yeah i'm saying that's more fun i mean doing a single yeah. cross for eight years is not yeah. fun it's it's yeah. laborious and and right now nobody cares for it either so yeah right, and, so, yeah and, and you know talking about with some of these f2s like with organ cbds and how their f2s kind of expose themselves it kind of goes down another slippery slope and again something monsanto did i think is what 1997 they came out with that terminator gene and so now they can put this gene in there that it just won't create a second, you know, a second generation. And again, there's a lot of doom and gloom around those ideas, but from a guy that enjoys the plant science, it's like, 
that is a way for breeders to maintain, you know, what they want, whether you agree with that or not, you know, I'm stand, I stand on the fence, I guess. Um, yeah. Because I do want to support people putting money into these long-term projects. And so somehow they got to get their money back. Um, you know, and then they, they talk about trader genes. I think Monsanto again came out with that like 98. Now that stuff's no good. Like where you're putting in a gene and you're getting transgenic breeding, but you put yeah, in a gene that says, yeah. well, and it's saying this plant will only recognize this brand of fertilizer. And then you're, then you're brand marketing. So then you say, grow this corn it only grows with my fertilizer. And that's been, that hasn't been allowed legally in, in legal breeding, but you know, stuff like that on the underground is happening. And so there is this fine line of science taking it too far. And some of these companies like Monsanto taking it too far, but there is something to it. There's a reason some of these, you know, ideas started up and cannabis is getting to the point where they're realizing that they're like, okay, the way I do want to protect my work I've been doing, I do want to, you know, kind of create a name for myself without somebody else just, you know, buying the clone and, or, or whatever and, and cloning forward. And so, and, you know, and with, with inbreeding, there's definitely downsides. Like there's inbreeding depression. You know, right. I think the old famous Darwin paper, you know, so you do get some downsides of inbreeding. So you always want both attempts at breeding. You always want to keep the gene pool diverse, but you still want to breed it down. And then, you know, even when a lot of breeding projects start with clones, you know, clones are predominantly heterozygous, so they're they're going to want to revert quick. So they get that inbreeding depression. You know, it's usually in two or three generations that you see clones start to degenerate. So it's mixing both worlds and kind of growing together. And ultimately, you know, and like I said, for a guy like me, ultimately, I want to say I want to put 2000 feminized seeds in my greenhouse and I all want them to look like this, you know, nice mm -hmm. and perfect. It makes my life easier. And ultimately, it makes things more efficient it makes the final product cheaper to produce and you know my goal is i want quality flour at a low price and these are kind of the methods i see of getting there right yeah and and, and, and you know and then it, it comes back to like uh the goals of the breeders like are you breeding for a smokable product you know because it's like it's possible that a lot of these large-scale farms that are you know growing thousands of acres or it's just going to end up in extract so you don't care if you have you know just one terpene dominant cultivar or something you know that you know that's all going to be removed in the end um but yeah as as a farmer you know that's breeding for you know kind of um terpene rich smokable flower it's you know it's especially coming from cbd whenever you know in the beginning everything kind of had that cherry kind of uh flavor right. and and to yeah. into you know and within five years now we're getting all kinds of kind of new profiles and a lot of that is is you know it's basically um just small breeders for the most part, I think, oh, 100%, pushing the industry yeah. forward. And so, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it will be interesting to see kind of like the di divergent, um, uh, you know, like where, where it goes ultimately. And I think we won't see that, you know, for who knows, 10, 20 years, I think, you know, because legalization is really what's going to ultimately be the indicator of, of where we head, right? I mean, we're still operating in a somewhat kind of just gray area for the most part. Um, and I think right. that's why you see it. Uh, you don't you don't see a lot of the stuff like you're talking about the production lines because people are afraid that you know as soon as they put it out it's just going to get knocked off right um well but, and the market's changing so fast you know at first like you said it was all cherry wines and unos and all of the cherry crosses and they smelled the same and, yeah. and they're pretty but not good <laughs> but then the market changes very swift to more of the smokable and then like cbg and all of the kind of minor cannabinoids became a popular thing and you know now it's like can you breed thca varieties and and so it's yeah. hard for a, a crop that takes so long to perfect to, to try to always you know please the the market and the so consumer, yeah it's tough yeah. It, yeah it's it's a tough spot and that's where i think both teams well even yeah even like for example uh like i've noticed cbg flower you know like that's my number one request as of late and i think everybody kind of grew a bunch of cbg thinking it was the next big cannabinoid um and, and they were just kind of flooded with it when the consumer wasn't even aware of what it was right and so i think farmers kind of just moved away from there while products you know kind of lost value and eventually they ended up liquidating it and now not a lot of farms are growing it and not a bleeder, not a lot of breeders were even focusing on it you know and so it's like uh, uh it's the same thing the the first cbg was pretty bland uh, flavor wise um right. and so now you have you know like we've got several different cbg lines that you know are are terpene rich or mixed ratio cbd cbg which 
are some of my favorite. And I think it's, uh, I don't know. I mean, at this point, you know, we're so early in the game that it goes back to like, I think, and that's the beautiful thing, right? With kind of a, a free market system is, you know, we're not like these established industries like energy or tech or, or where you can potentially be a small breeder in your garage. And if you, if you put in the work and you sacrifice and you have the passion, you could potentially do it for a living. And I think that's kind of the background that I come from is like, you know, I, I, I've been on cannabis for 15 years. I went through the medical industry, you know, I bred, you know, for 10 years and then done it, you know, breeding and, and cultivating commercially for the last, you know, four years, I guess, since 19. And, uh, and those first two years, I worked a full-time, you know, job and I did the, the hemp thing on the side. And so it wasn't like I just started a job and was, you know, paying the bills. And, and so I think it, you know, that there is something to be said for the sacrifice and stuff that, that people make. And then also, you know, um, like you said, not all seed is created equal. And, and I think when you start a new industry, you look at any industry and it, and it builds upon its mistakes and it builds upon everything that kind of came before it. And we're, we're still in, especially really, you know, the cannabis industry, we're still in its infancy. And, and I think one thing where the cannabis or the hemp, hemp side of things can go is like, you know, we have almost, you know, we have all the, the cannabinoids, right? The, whereas like kind of the, yeah. the rec market is really geared towards THC in specific, specifically. And I think it, I, and my hopes are that they will eventually collide, right? I think that as the consumer becomes more educated and they wake up to the fact that these other kind of non-psychoactive cannabinoids actually do have some health benefit, um, it, you know, it, it will kind of catapult us into to new areas. Um, yeah, no, I, I 100% think type twos are going to be the future. I mean, yeah. they won't dominate, but I think they're going to be a big part of what's out there. I think people are getting tired of just chasing 30% THC cultivars. And especially for the older demographic of smokers, they're not looking for something that's going to get them 100% lit. You know, so these type twos that are coming out are, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've seen them gain popularity, at least in the small circles and who I talk to. But for me, on, you know, what I call my breeding, just putting plants together in my greenhouse that's always kind of where i'm looking at like as i see plants in the mass i'll grab one here or there just because it's like hey these are cool let's put them together and then i can sit on these yeah. seeds and one day maybe somebody else can make something cool of them but yeah those type twos i, I think are, are going to become more popular as the market matures i think yeah and yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And I think coming from like, you know, our hemp background, we deal with a lot of people that are, are more interested in the novel cannabinoids and, and maybe have a little more education about it because they're curious, right? Whereas like, I've got a lot of friends that are, uh, you know, stoners, they, they don't, they kind of think it's a waste of time, you know, right. so it's. Yeah, I think, I think a lot of people still think that, oh, hemp, you can, why are you guys smoking shirts? Yeah, I think right, there's a lot right. of that yeah. Or why are you wasting your growth space on growing something that, you know, doesn't get you stoned. And so, right. but I think that's a product of prohibition, right? It's like, you would never waste your space growing, you know, I mean, and that's even, you know, they're like speaking on land races and stuff, you know, a lot of them aren't the heaviest yielders or like, but they all, you know, as far as genetics go, they're extremely diverse. And that's where we're actually pulling out a lot of these minor, can, you know, cannabinoids. And so, um, I, I, there, there's a place in the garden, but it's like now through legalization, you know, the people that are interested are no longer afraid of like, you know, getting busted or, you know, so it's like, right. it really is like a renaissance as far as like cannabis breeding goes. And, and, you know, and I, I think it's hard to have a platform and like have a barrier to entry to get into, you know, to kind of get your work out there if you are a small breeder. But, uh, but I think if you, it, you know, if you do things right, um, I, I think you can offer something unique to, to the gene pool, um, rather than, you know, like it, you know, just crossing like the next like hype strain to hype strain, you know, and, and what ultimately sure. ends up is, is just kind of like this bland product that looks good online. But in fact, when you, when you, when you consume it, it, it doesn't really hit the mark. And I, you know, so it, but right. that, you know, that can be sold to, you know, a novice consumer, right. Somebody that hasn't had, you know, legal cannabis, but eventually as legalization happens, and people are become, you know, you know, consumers and become aware of what else is out there. Um, their palate's going to change. And, and like you said, I think type twos will become more common. Um, yeah. And I, and I think that's a, that's an important role as a breeder is like, I grow out not only my own seed that I make, but, you know, countless others, you know, seed. And so it's like, right. I think, you know, your perception kind of determines your selection. Right. So it's like, if, you know, you may, you know, 
you know, just, you know, like you may have, you may have only seen a few cannabis strains your whole life, you know, as a grower. And so you're, you know, you're basing what you think is good on something that may not necessarily be good to somebody that's grown out, you know, thousands of other varieties. And right. I think you coming from Colorado, obviously, you know, you've been like, you've had legal cannabis as long as I have here in Washington. And so in many ways, yeah. we've grown up looking, consuming, and being kind of spoiled in many ways. And so, and, and you look to California, and I think that's where a lot of the, you know, some of the more successful breeders coming, not, you know, and then also combining that knowledge of culture and, and different, you know, types of cannabis with breeding techniques and kind of like, you know, the back, you know, so, yeah. Yeah. And that, well, I think that's one cool thing mm -hmm. that social media and Instagram is kind of brought to the cannabis culture as much as Instagram kind of negates what we do. Yeah. But, you know, you figure prior to Instagram and legalization, you know, to see another grow, you had to know a dude and you had like, it wasn't just this, Oh, let me go on Instagram and let me see how a thousand people are growing their plants. It was very yeah. controlled info. And I think that's still why you get this bro science kind of mentality because they all came, you know, everyone's doing their own experiment in their own little rooms and then all of a sudden the doors are open and everyone's like, oh, wait, I'm not doing this right. Or, oh, this guy's doing this much better than me. But then they tend to be stubborn and stick with it. Like, well, it's worked for me. And, and cannabis is a very resilient plant. It can grow, you know, from 40 degrees to 110 degrees, huge, wide yeah. varieties. And so when people say, well, it worked for me and it worked for me, it's like, yeah, it probably did. Cannabis is a tough plant. But so it's trying to work through all that and figure out, all right, what's in the goal. And, and again, the goal, like you said a few times, is different for me. My goal, you know, I, as a younger person growing up prior to legalization, my goal was always like, I remember talking, you'd go to the gas station. And I'd be like, man, one day they're going to have marijuana lights up there. And that was cool. Like that was something we aspired to. But you say that now and people just like, like, oh, what? That's corporate takeover. But, but back then it was like, man, if we could have it legal, we could have it accessible, like cheap. Those were the things we cared about. And, yeah. and now it's become this very very connoisseur market, you know, there's this very, uh, I mean, it's not even that old of a market. And we went from 10 years ago, just saying, here's my 20 bucks. Let me get a Ziploc of whatever is in there. And you're happy to about your day. And nowadays it's, there's this full swing of, you know, it's, it's, it's very, as you know, it's like the, the connoisseur market is kind of taken over yeah. and it's speaking volumes, which is cool. It should be there. Um, but not to take away from the fact that we still want to produce this at, you know, as efficient as possible to be as sustainable as possible and, right. and create a product that's safe for everybody to access. That's not expensive. And unfortunately canvas it's getting there, but still, I don't think as cheap as it, it could be. And I, and I think a lot of people would disagree with that, but, but again, my goal is always efficiency. Like how can we make this efficient without losing quality and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, no, absolutely, man. And like, that's one of my goals as a breeder is like, I think, you know, and, and it may upset a lot of people, but it's like, I hope that, you know, cannabis hemp seed would be as cheap as veggie seeds that you could go buy it at every, you know, your, your hardware store right. um, next to your, you know, lettuce and tomatoes like, like that is. And I mean, there are heirloom, you know, um, veggie breeders that are successful, you know, regional, they breed for their region and you can go in and, and they, they're small farms like uh, one of my favorite on the West coast is uh, strictly medicinal. You know, I'll just give them a shout out. They, uh, all kinds of, you know, medicinal starts. And it's just a small family, small family farm that has been operating and, and growing for probably decades, you know, for sure. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think that, that, that is an important aspect. And then like to speak to efficiency as a breeder, I think that's one of the most important aspects. Like for me, I've been able to create a system where I can like sell my pheno hunted flour. So like, there's no, there's no like, you know, waste as far as like, um, uh, what I'm doing. Right. So it's like, I can, uh, I can, you know, capture, you know, that like, whereas like a lot of people, I, I don't know if they have that opportunity, but it's like, I've, I've kind of figured out a system where it's like, um, you know, before I thought, you know, I kind of had to do the pheno hunts and, and, and chalk it up to like, you know, whatever, and, and then do, you know, clone runs to have that kind of uniformity. And in fact, I, I did a couple of those, you know, as like early last year and kind of grew the same things round after round. And, and, uh, and my, the customers got tired of it. Like they wanted right. the new, like they wanted to be the first ones to try something. And so, um, 
and, 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 you know, and as a breeder too, like it was, you know, I think I have to give a shout out to uh, Thomas at High Alpine because he kind of uh, gave me a, a hand up as far as like vouching and kind of giving me a platform, but it's still hard to get people to grow your seed if they've never, you know, they don't know who you are. And so All I right. made an effort to grow my own seed produce the flower and then kind of put that on the market and then be like, you know, so it's like, you do have to put, put the work into as a breeder. And, and if nobody's willing to vouch for you, you kind of have to put, put yourself out on the line. Um, and so, I mean, just coming, you know, like we, you know, we're, we're a pretty small company, you know, it's just me and my wife doing um, the majority, like I do most of the cultivating and my wife handles the office, which is like 50, 60 hours a week. You know, it's not, right. it's not easy doing what we do, but you know, we do it because we love it. And, uh, and, and I think it goes back to like, um, this is a, you know, kind of a new emerging industry and there is room for people to, um, to grow a small family business. If you, if you have what it takes, you know, if you're willing to take the, those opportunity costs and kind of like forego and sacrifice and, and it's like building any business, you know, you got it's sweat equity, you know, it's, it's working late hours. And, and ultimately I think if you're producing a good product, in the end, you know, you'll, you'll, you can be successful. Um, whereas like a lot of the, you know, um, a lot of these businesses and well, and, and I mean, we can say that for every breeder right now, even, in, even Oregon CBD had kind of small roots, right. They just sure. were in the right place at the right time. And then they took the knowledge and reinvested in themselves and, and grew to what they are today. Um, and, and they, I think they can be a kind of a model for other breeders. But with that said, you, you know, like I came into it, this a little late, like I think Oregon and Colorado had two years jump and you had breeders that were selling shitty seed and making millions of dollars, you know, yeah. and, 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 and then maybe they didn't realize like what, it, you know, what catapulted them to success. Right. And a lot of those breeders aren't around today. Like even breeders that I started with in 2019, I mean, I could probably name on one hand, this, the breeders that I kind of came up with. Um, right. And so, yeah, I mean, you too. You, you you've been through that, right? We can, right. Yeah, I was, I was say we kind of went through the same thing. You know, at CSU when I first started, and this would have been 2017, 2018. We were doing research trials, and so we had hemp in the greenhouse there. And then, uh, so New West Genetics was a company at the time. Dr. McKay there, and so he had plants going, and so we would exchange males and females within the crop. But at his time, and and it's still his focus is uh, fiber and field production and field crops. And so I think he was setting a good example of what breeding should look like because he's coming from that academic side of it. Yeah. So he had that rigor and, but he's, he was slow behind to create varieties. And so there was this need in the market where it was 2018. Now all of these farmers out here in Colorado wanted to convert their alfalfa or their wheat to, to hemp. And so there was this quick need of thousands of thousands of seeds to, you know, fill a hundred acres or 500 acre parcels. And so then these, you know, nefarious breeders would just show up and be like, oh, yeah, I got here you go. Here's a, you know, feminized seed, four dollars a piece. This is going to make you millions. And these poor farmers didn't know any different. They're like, oh, how much will I make? Four dollars a seed. That seems like a lot. So they'd spend, you know, half a million dollars on seeds. They weren't right. feminized. They weren't even the same genetics. The company would disappear. And so I know a lot of stories like that. And, yep. and that's the thing with breeding. And I guess, again, that touches on, is it too easy? Because if you can if doing it incorrectly can be easy, you can just smash something together. You could put a fake name on it, you know, blueberry mushroom pie or whatever, and send mm -hmm. it out there, put some cool pictures of a plant that, you know, doesn't look anything like what it turns out. And so there's, there's room for a lot of people to come in and do that. And so having the integrity of a company that says, Hey, we put in the work, we really stand behind these lines and, and create it is i think different and and so both of those and again like i've said before i mean there's no room for the nefarious people just lying out there yeah. but there is room for the people creating you know i kind of equate it to like uh or i guess a metaphor would be like gold miners you have the prospectors which i think are like the small breeders they're out there finding it they're putting the work in they're traveling up the mountain you know they're looking for the shiny rocks but once they find it their kind of excitement withers and they want to go find a new one but that's when you know the the long-term breeders show up and they build a mine and they trudge it out and they get the gold and they produce it. And so you need both of those actors there, but they're, they're doing different things. And so I think as long as we both have somebody creating the new varieties and then somebody stabilizing it to make sure it sticks around is I, I guess what I, what I would envision being ideal. Yeah. Yeah. And I think like, you know, especially in new industries, there's, there always tends to be a gold rush, right? 
and that's where you have room for scammers. But you'll never build a long-term company selling shoddy seed. You'll never get right. that return customer. And, and I think any breeder can agree that it's the return customers that keep you alive. Um, you know, like you don't need a big, you know, you don't need a lot of customers if they're return customers, you know, and for like sure. you can create a, a, a solid base, a solid following. And, um, and I think, you know, and there's something to be said for that. And, and, and I think that, you know, in the long term, and it goes back, you know, only time will tell who kind of sticks around and what their contributions are uh, uh, to the gene pool, to, to the industry. Um, but yeah, to bring it back, like, is breeding too easy? You know, like for us, the standard is, you know, feminized production seed, which can't, you know, kind of go unnoticed. Whereas like male, female breeding is easy. Like you, you could do that accidentally. Right. And I don't even think that's, you know, and like also too, it's like, at what point do we, we begin, you know, is it breeding, right? It, it, like pollen chucking necessarily isn't breed. Is it, does that, you know, you have to kind of like peel back the layers. Is it an intention and a goal? Because breeding is, is always to improve upon the previous. Right. And so, yeah. I mean, so you kind of have to, you know, understand the definition, but feminizing seed isn't the easiest. I mean, I think I had three failed feminized runs <laughs> last year. And so like that, that's going to keep, that's going to keep a lot of people out of the, the game. Just, uh, just keep yeah, the, that, that alone keeps me out of it. I think I've failed <laughs> as much as Thomas has tried to help with the formula. I, I failed at it every time, but yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, no. And, and so like, and, and even, and I mean, most breeders that, you know, have successful feminized runs will tell you, you, you know, they, they fail, you know, each year, I think, you, you know, you have stuff that it won't, re won't reverse, no matter how hard you try, you'll have stuff that will reverse, but not drop pollen. Um, and so, it, you know, and, and a lot of that is kind of like, you know, variety specific and some, some will just reverse, you know, with a few sprays. And so, and then it's also, you know, like you said, you have to know the recipe and, and the technique, you know, you mm -hmm. generally want to feminize, um, flip and feminize those earlier because, you know, they, they feminize plants take longer to drop pollen than like a regular male would. And so, and all that stuff is like, you know, that's not anything I read in a book, you know, that's just right. failing over and over right. and trying. And, and I think that's where we're at. And so it's like, we have the time and it's like, once you figure out a system that works and that, and that's part of the reason why I'm here today too. It's like, I, I think you you hold a lot of knowledge in your head, you know, just from experience and what you've gone through. And same with me. And and I'm at the point where like I work alone all day long and I don't talk to a lot of people. And so it's like yeah. this is this is like therapeutic, you know, in many ways, this is kind of like cathartic, like getting on and talking to somebody that has a similar passion. For sure. Um, and, and so like so, yeah, no, I, I think. Uh, but yeah, feminizing, it, it's not it's not easy. And that is the standard in the hemp industry. And I think that will yeah. be, and it's becoming the standard in the cannabis industry, particularly for production lines. Absolutely. Um, well, so let me ask you this then. Why, because I've looked in the past and there's a few places, but why is feminized pollen not being sold more often? It seems like that would be pretty lucrative. Does it just not stay viable or does that so, seem like an easy way to get somebody, get over that barrier of entry and create a valuable product? I mean, you guys could sell that $100 a gram. I mean, more than that. Yeah. Yeah, no, and I have sold it in the past and stuff. I mean, the main issue is is stability, right? Like I, so in order to prevent uh, failed pollinations, I, you know, typically I have my number one like choice, right? Um, and as of late, I've started doing backup reversals and storing pollen. But even then, I would never count on stored pollen as my go, like, oh, I've got this stored pollen, that's going to be my next project. Like I just, because right. I've had, I've had those fail. And so it's, it's, you can, you know, you can do every precaution as far as making sure your pollen is completely dry, using desiccants, storing it in a completely sealed container in your fridge. And so, but, and, and you can pull out pollen that is years old and it'll pollinate just fine. Or you can pull out pollen that's six months old. And, and I don't know what, you know, the, I don't have a specific answer. I mean, there could have just been one factor that wasn't, um, you know, that, that was, was out of my control that I didn't, you know, account for. And I think that's a part of it because, you know, you might, you might have, you know, eight out of 10 pollen sales are just fine, but then you get, you know, you sell a couple right. grams and, and it's a failed product. And, but it could almost I mean, be guess, as traditional seeds are, you could say, well, it, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of an as a, hey, it's, you know, the, yeah. you know, it's, it kind of is what it is. And I think a lot of, cause I, you can look at a lot of seed customers or consumers and, and like the small scale guys, like the guys buying, you know, $300 
cookie or whatever. Yeah, they're, yeah. they're very um, forgiving consumers. They'll spend $150 oh, on absolutely. a seed that produces a male and they're happy about it. And so I, mean, I, I guess yeah. that's what I poke fun at a little bit. It's like, if you're going to spend that much money, it better be an inbred line that's going to produce amazing results forever. But that's the consumers just, they're not there. They're yeah. just like, ah, well, whatever and whatever it is, I'm happy with it. So yeah, yeah that good. is funny. I mean, like I remember the candy rain fiasco, like $500 packs that oh, were right. all like, none of them germinated. Like I had a buddy and yeah, I mean, you could, you people found decent stuff in there, but, but, but yeah, I mean, I, I'm a consumer myself. I mean, I, I probably, you know, like people scroll social media, like I scroll seed banks, you know, it's like, <laughs> yeah. I'm always like, I'm out there looking, you know? So, I mean, I grow uh, a lot of stuff out and, and like, I'll be the, like, I found a, a male in uh, Oregon CBD's Pine Walker, you know, they're triploid yeah. variety, like a full blown resinous stinky male. And like, and the pollen was viable. So like yeah. even the best of us, you know, there, there's no foolproof way. I mean, and, and that goes back, like maybe these uh, Monsanto types will get to the point through genetic engineering that they can kind of uh, prevent that from happening. Yeah, well, because I, I think, think even the best is they say is ninety nine percent. I think is what most of these companies will stick by, like you know the Johnny's yeah. and some of these. They'll say ninety nine percent is kind of the best we can get. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I, I think even for cannabis, it's probably less. I mean, we can you can most viewers can put that on there, but you know that was growing fifty seeds out, you know, of the right. pine walkers, and I mean, there, I was True. happy, like I was, I was stoked that I found, you know, but I mean, it's right. so. So that's probably, you know, one of the, the top breeders, but it, so it's, it's going to happen. And I think as you know, I think there's also consumers that are extremely hard, you know, sometimes too, uh, that may judge too early, but I mean that like, I'm, you know, like I I've grown out breeders that I trusted and, and, uh, you know, some of my favorite breeders and, and had, you know, like intersex issues and, and like, and I'm gu gu guilty of it too. Right. you like there, you just, you know, you can test your lines as best as you could, and then somebody could grow it in a different environment or, or stress it out, and sure. uh, and and they're able to do what you couldn't do. And so, um, I mean, this plant is, you know, it's designed to survive, right? So intersex is built into it, no matter how much we try and, and breed breed it out. Like, it, you For know, sure. I mean, it, that's just that's just part of it, and it's, you know, so, um, but yeah, no, I think overall there's something to be said for kind of raising the standards. And, and, and as long as the consumer is, you know, content with, uh, you know, with poly hybrids and, and, and a yeah. lower standard of seed, then that will be the case. But, um, and it will be these production guys, like the, the bigger farmers, you know, right. It, in a lot of places, legal farms are limited by canopy. And so clones right. are still the, the about, you know, the, the cost it takes to clone is still justified, but like we're entering a time where I, I think, you know, I, like I'm kind of like, I still, you know, have a lot of friends in the cannabis, cannabis industry and the rec industry on the West coast and, uh, for high grade cannabis, you know, like top shelf there, you know, farms are, are struggling to get $800 a pound, you know? Yeah. I mean, Colorado, and, we're 500. Yeah. The... Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah, for, for, for like your, your average flower, I mean, you're going down to yeah three, 500, but I'm talking like, premium indoor top shelf, like, you know, yeah. cured properly, like $800, which is insane. Like, you know, you're barely making money and that's, yeah. and that's just the, where their mark, you know, the kind of the market's at. Yeah. And well, so, and that's, and I mean, and this could, I guess be a topic for a whole other debate, but that that's the key of the research we've been doing out here the last, you know, 10 years since I built the greenhouse is how efficient can we do it? That was always right. my most important bragging point is my total cost per pound. And you talk to a lot yeah. of growers, they don't even know what they don't even know the cost per pound. It's more right. about and so you know, and we were at our best run. We were down to our cost per pound. This includes labor, energy, everything. We we're around fifty to sixty bucks was our total cost per pound. So at that's, that point, yeah. eight hundred dollars, five hundred dollars, that's a lot of profit. And so and that was kind of the mantra I was trying to, you know, pass on to everybody. It's like you can do this without all the lighting, without all, it's like, you're not going to have as big of yields and all that, but if yeah. the market's going to flood in, you know, if you're dealing with $500 pounds, it doesn't matter how pretty your flower is. If you need, you know, cause a lot of these guys, their cost of production, indoor facilities, 600 bucks a pound is usually their cost of production. I think that's coming down a yeah. little bit, but if, yeah, if my, you, know, if you I, can't even make what you sell it for. Yeah. I have a, we have a family friend here that runs a tier three He's a big producer and, and you would be uh, impressed with his facility. He's got his uh, cost per pound at 300. 
Um, he recycles all his nutrients. It's in a hydroponic uh, medium. So he actually uses no medium. Nice. Um, yeah. And uh, so, you know, it cycles through. It, it, the computer reevaluates and, and readjusts nice. the fertilizer. And I mean, so like he can come down quite a bit and still be profitable. Um, right. And so, I mean, as far as indoor, I think, you know, I mean, green $50 a pound is incredible. I mean, the only by... Only. Well, that's because I have no light. That's the biggest thing. I mean, right. I have limited yeah. labor because me too. I'm the only one out here. I mean, I run yeah. 5,000 square foot greenhouse from seed to harvest. So it's eliminating yeah. labor, but then lighting. And, and that's why I always say I think indoor gardening it, is going to kind of fizzle away. They just It's just too intensive. It's hard to keep up with those prices. Yeah, I think it will be kind of yeah cost prohibitive eventually. And I mean, there may be niche markets, high end connoisseur, like, sure. you know, and, and that may always be a thing. But I think for the majority, like, yeah, when you can get outdoor, you know, down to $10, $10 a pound, you know, like, right. uh, you know, with minimal inputs and, and, uh, you know, cheaper labor. And, and that's when we start getting into the global market, I think, you know, where you have these, uh, you know, most high labor, like high labor crops are outsourced to countries with cheaper labor. And so, sure. um, but we won't see that until you have global legalization and, and import and export laws. Um, yeah. But the same the same can be said for breeding, you know, like I, I, I've done the math and like, if I do greenhouse seed runs, you know, I could be profitable at 10 cents a seed, um, yeah. you know, but I can't sell all that seed. And so I do kind of smaller, you know, like, and I do smaller runs now and uh, you know, I do variety and, and I, you know, at the same time, I'm also doing, you know, like doing stuff for like bulk stuff, you know, like bulk right. varieties that I can do at a cheaper price. Um, but yeah. for the most part, uh, I've just been doing smaller seed runs and leaving the greenhouse space open for, for uh, kind of pheno hunts and selecting, which has, you know, has worked. Um, especially since, you know, like I said, I think, and I think that's, this can be said for most breeders, I, I'd be interested to know, but I think most breeders probably make most of their income on cultivating at least in, in this yeah. market. Um, and so, yeah. 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 And you know, and, and hemp was kind of in the same but as far as what I was trying to do, I, you know, at first I wasn't doing, I wanted to do volume because in 2018, smokable flour was 900 bucks a pound you know, and yeah. everybody wanted it. Now that's kind of crashed. But yeah, my mentality was I want to grow bulk. I wanted to deal just wholesale. And so yeah. I would go to vendors and like I said, 2018, 19, it was, it was good. But then the last few years, you know, there is no real wholesale market for that kind of intermediate to, mm -hmm. to higher quality flour. So I would show up, say, Hey, you know, you guys want 300 pounds at this price. They're like, no, but we'll buy four pounds at a thousand dollars. And it's like, wait a second. And so <laughs> it, it really created smokable hemp flour is small niche producers. Cause I was just producing way right. too much that nobody wanted 300 pounds right. of super sour space candy. And so then yeah. you kind of get into some of these other crazier, you know, more unique genetics. But then you run into producing that at large scale because of, you know, what we're talking about, just not having, they weren't, homo you know, homogenized. I couldn't get those runs out. And so at that point, it's really more beneficial to the small grower that can do 10 plants of each variety and sell them, you know, four or five times as much as I sell my flower. And I think yeah. they're doing well. And then especially you get to some of these, you know, companies that are, like I said, are producing some of these THCAs and some Delta 8 sprays. There's so many loopholes that now. Yeah, like, I know. And that's, yeah. Selling legit that's, flour, like legit compliant flour. It's, it's a hard, it's a hard business right now. Which, uh, it's the same thing that I mentioned with CBG. I think you're seeing a lot of, you're going to see a lot of these farmers try and switch over to THCA flour, which, you know, I mean, that's a whole kind of discussion itself. I don't think I want to go there, but, <laughs> yeah. um, but, uh, but then, you know, there's going to be a CBD drought. And there are, there's a big consumer base that want high quality, flavorful, you know, properly cured CBD flour. For sure. And, and, and I think you're going to see the price come back up. I mean, that's the crazy thing with, with the marketplace, right? Is like prices drop below a certain threshold and it, and it pushes out a lot of people. And it's like, you have to have a passion for what you're doing in order to stick around. And, and I think from the breeding perspective too, it's like in order to ride out a recession, um, you really have to kind of, you have to be as efficient as possible you have to cut your inputs down as low as you can and still produce a valuable or a quality product not right. you know both from the breeding perspective and from you know kind of the end product the flower side of things and like and that's kind of one of my goals is like if i can produce seed for even cheaper or flour you know i mean and like so i sell my flour you know i'd say 
a little cheaper than I, I most people do because it's you know it's uh their pheno hunt so it's like right. a lot you know there there's some variation um especially when you get into like cbd cbg hybrids where even within uh different plants the chemotype varies right sure. um but they're you know as long as you're transparent and you're not you know and your consumer knows that that's what they're buying and the the value is is priced accordingly you know you can you can be profitable um the problem i see especially with the thc is people they're you know they're struggling especially when times get tough you just you're you just hop where the money is and so yeah. it's you know you still have to but i think you still have to have kind of like some integrity and some kind of goal in mind like you know because that's going to dry up eventually too right it's like any any kind of like once regulation sets in then like you know even within my state they're they're debating in our our senate right now like uh adding you know the cbd uh content to edibles right like they want to limit that and, and it's a big discussion and you've got the rec guys fighting against the the hemp lobbyists because the the the, 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 the rec guys don't want any thc allowed and right. you know so it's it i mean there's just there's so many aspects to this industry that it's it's hard to even take like that macro view or whatever and like stand back and kind of like look at the bigger picture but um right well and it's hard to keep the integrity going you know i've I've could have made a lot more money in this industry if i you know made different decisions you know as far as yeah. like i had the opportunity to jump on delta eight when that was first popular i guarantee yeah. i could have sold crazy amounts of that and and then when hhc yeah. and all these other things came out and everyone you, you know you could jump on those and make a lot of money but it's going to be a quick investment and then and at least in my mind it kind of tarnishes the integrity of that company a little bit but right. at the same time I, I know a lot of hemp farms that have gone out of business so if that's their last decision to keep the family farm running you know i i, I can't i can't hate them for that it's more of just yeah the the gray area that we're in and because i have a few thca genetics that you know they'll they're type twos you know 10 percent thc nine percent cbd 0. Yeah. 0.2 total delta nine it's like, and it's great terpenes, like fantastic flower, but yeah. I'm not going to take the risk to sell it and get it out there, you know. But then you'll see, you know, you go online, you'll see 29% THCA flower that you could just buy, have delivered to your door, and it's like that's that's going to be crazy if that doesn't get a hold of, because that's going to hurt the the traditional rec market. You can just buy straight up weed online. Yeah, but, yeah. I mean, like, there's always right. There's always going to be, you know, people are going to push the boundaries as much as they can. Right. I mean, honestly, my, the medical cannabis industry was created through a loophole. Like I ran a, you know, I ran a dispensary um, with my brother-in-law for a couple of years. And uh, you know, it's it, the way that the laws were written was, you know, everybody, you know, joined the, you know, kind of like the collective, right. And everything was based on donations. And so like, I think our industry was kind of based on that mindset of like um, taking advantage of the loopholes. And, right. and, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think, you know, people deserve access to this plant, you know, regardless of the laws. I mean, I, I think prohibition has kind of proven that like um, right. we're, we're so far behind where we could be, not only from the medicinal side, which is, I think, where I kind of approach things from, you know, the recreational side, medicinal. But then also you look at like everything else as far as the industrial, uh, you know, aspect of it, like plastics, building material. I mean, I, sure. I come from a tradition, you know, a construction background and, uh, and it's just mind blowing to see some of these products that we could have had, you know, decades ago, um, right. and where, where we would be now. So it's, you know, um, so yeah, I, I don't blame people, like you said, for that. I do, you know, when it, you get into isomers and stuff and some of the, the methods that it takes to create those, that's kind of where I draw the line. I prefer more of a, like the natural cannabinoids, like something sure. that you're going to pull from the plant, like even, you know, they do like, uh, you can get THCV leaders now that are converted from CBDV. And it's like, yeah. it like molecularly, I, I'm sure that it probably is the same, but um, is it, you know, you, I don't know. So it's just, I mean, that's a whole other argument. I'm not, I don't have enough experience or knowledge to speak on it, you know, but. Um, yeah, because then it, it goes what, into the guys creating cannabinoids from yeast. <laughs> right. Yeah. And then, right? then yeah, we're right. all out of business. Yep. Yeah. But then, but you all, you know, it's the same thing. It's like, why choose organic food over conventional grown sure. food, right? It's, you have these people that they understand, you know, kind of the, the bigger systems at play and the fact that kind of, you know, um, you know, think like obviously the natural way 
not necessarily is the best, you know, way, but it, it, at least, you know, it's natural. Right. And so right. like, there's something to be said for, uh, you know, and that's why, like, one of my interests is like minors and like, you know, breeding for CBDV, THCV. And like, I think eventually they will serve a role. And, and like, what one of the driving factors for me is people that use this plant medicinally that make sure. and make, you know, that can grow a few plants, make a tincture and ultimately change their life, whether it's like CBG and like Crohn's and IBS. Like, I mean, a lot of the, you know, pharmaceuticals eventually lose, you know, effectiveness. And right. then you have this plant, which it's like a lock and key mechanism. Like our bodies are designed um, for cannabinoids, right? Like we sure. we have a, an entire system. And so it just makes sense that like potentially there's all kinds of cures hidden within this plant. And like I, we are just scratching the surface. And so as a breeder, that that's what piques me at my interest and what keeps me going. Because for me, I'm not just breeding for THC or for, or to get high. It's like to me, it's like I have this endless supply of different colors and tools to draw from and i could spend my entire life doing this and and feel like i never got anywhere and and like yeah. the goal is to have ibl lines for true breeding purposes to have auto flower lines you know for for, for true sure. breeding for and, and and it's like but you got to start somewhere and so that's kind of where um like uh it, you got to get your boots on the ground. And like, for somebody like me that doesn't necessarily have like a, a ton of resources, you're limited, you know, by your canopy and what you can afford each month. Like, you know, I, I run my greenhouses yeah. year round. So propane is a, you know, yeah, that's the only reason I'm, this is the first, first winter in 10 years. I'm not running just cause it's like, ah, the propane is too much and, and time to yeah, take a break and do some other things. But, but yeah, I mean, and I think as you say, it's something we didn't talk about a little bit on breeding is there's, there's so many different options. Like in Canada's right now, right. it's chemo type. They just want to breed for what's highest, but I think traditionally breeding had different purposes. You know, you would go back to Borlaug. He, you know, he got put on the map for making dwarf wheat. So it, it, so yeah. it's breeding plants. And, and to me, this gets into the commercial side of things of if you can breed a plant that just fits my climate, that handles pruning well, that doesn't need trellising, that is just a beast for growing and production. As a grower, I want to grow that. Now, of course, right. let's perfect that and create good flavors and terpenes out of it. But I think there's so much more to breeding than just who's got the biggest flavor and the highest content. And I think in years as the, the market matures, we'll start to see some of that. But yeah, I would love to right. see, you know, cannabis strains that work well for hydroponic systems, cannabis systems that are better for living soil or or for raft culture or, you know, different setups. And then you could buy cultivars based on that. I think that'd be cool. Yeah, even like, you know, I've been working with, uh, there's a few, like on the West Coast, it's, it's WSU, uh, OSU, and UC Davis. They all kind of like combine their, their hemp programs and their research programs. And they've been growing some of my feminized fiber varieties out the past yeah. couple of years. And, and they want to do nice. kind of like bre breeding projects and stuff. And they use them for a control group when testing, doing trials on their, uh, you know, their other kind of like flower varieties because, they're, sure. you know, there's no, no pollen flying. And so they do like irrigation testing and, and, and different things. But, uh, so, but, you know, so in many, and that's the role of the universities, right? Is like when there is no industry, it's the universities and the grant money and the people that w with foresight, you know, it's like, for example, I come from, you know, construction and you have building codes, right? Well, here in the United States, we have no building codes that incorporate hemp materials. Whereas like in the European Union, they've been using uh, hemp for, you know, decades, right? So it's like, yeah. so we, we're already way behind. And it's like you, it takes legislation and kind of like, you know, the universities to kind of pull these rules and regulations together. Um, yeah, and so absolutely. it's just a long process. And in the meantime, us as, as, you know, kind of breeders and producers, like, you know, we have very little somewhat oversight, especially in the end use product. And I think that's where like THCA and, and all that stuff comes in. Um, yeah. Where, well, and so, and I, th I think federal, le federal legalization is going to change things a lot. So like right. when I was at Colorado State and we were doing hemp research there, it was, I mean, we were glad that they allowed us to do it, but we were looked on and, and maybe frowned upon oh, yeah. by certain people. And and I think they didn't quite know what they're getting into because you, you get some of the, you know, the dean of ag culture, he, they think hemp is fiber. And so they come in three months later and we have just the whole campus stinks. There's buds everywhere. We're transplanting yeah. huge colas. Uh, right. then they're kind of, we're singing a different tune of like, well, this isn't what we thought it was. We thought it was going to be like bamboo stalks. This is straight up like canvas looking weed. Like the students plant, are starting yeah. to ask questions. And, <laughs> and so we, 
we had to really kind of downscale and, and a lot of funding was, you know, at risk of being lost because other corporations didn't want to be seen as being part of the cannabis school. And, and so there's a lot of those stigmas that really prevent a lot of widespread research from happening. And so we ended up having to shut down our little program for different reasons, but that, that had a part of it. And so I think once it's federally legal, all of a sudden the, and the same is going to go for these bigger companies, not just academic research, but for some of these bigger breeding companies that they're like, all right, you know, we want to get into cannabis right now, but we're a huge company. We can't put our neck out there legally until it's confirmed, you know, cause it's still federally legal, you know, it's legal in States, yeah. but, but federally it's illegal. So that's, that's a huge barrier right now to some of these bigger companies and, and what that floodgate will look like when it's opened you know, I don't know, it could be terrible. Let me just get this massive nonsense out there, but I think it at least opens it up to just get some more of these larger, I guess, Oregon CBD type companies that have the facilities to do thousands of reps and have the money mm -hmm. to do it for 10 years and to really produce something. So, so I think it'll be weird and kind of interesting what we see come out of all that, but I think it'll ultimately end up, you know, most mostly for the better i guess as far as genetics goes hopefully yeah it'll it definitely will be interesting i've heard like some um some people say that it's possible that like the atf will regulate smokable hemp and cannabis you know and so that they'll yeah. roll that together and then you'll basically have industrial hemp being regulated by the department of ag and which that would you know that would basically lump all smokable and consumable you know stuff together um right which I mean, in my eyes, it's all one plant, you know, I mean, we're talking, you know, definitions and, 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 right. and percentages um, at the end of the day. But yeah, that, that that's fascinating. Cause like, I know, I, I believe it, what was it Colorado that found like it was, they found the loophole, right? Because by definition, hemp was like anything under 0.3. Right. And technically you can grow hash plants that are under 0.3. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and it really opened, you know, and so the other thing in Colorado is we started getting all of these grow operations, these like these underground kind of clandestine labs is popping up because by definition, if the cops or feds caught you in veg, that's hemp. Because you could test yeah. that veg plant at 0 0.3. And so there's so many of these loopholes that we're kind of getting taken advantage of. And and then, you know, with the edible side of things where it's 0 0.3 by weight. So you put 10 milligrams in a 100 milligram cookie and all of a sudden that's legal. So they're shipping, you know, fully Delta 9 edibles online. And and so, yeah, there's there's so many different loopholes. And that's why, you know, I see a lot of breeders kind of focus on you know, getting the total THC uh, at 0 0.3, but, you know, I've been growing hemp since 2018 and I've yet to see a plant that resembles anything anybody wants. That's 0 0.3 total THC. So the whole market is kind of this facade of it's hemp, but yeah. you know, you decarb everything and you get total THC values. None of it's traditionally 0.3%. And yeah, maybe and even, you can speak to that more, but yeah, I mean, that, that's a huge issue. You know, I mean, it, it, they're like, as a hemp farmer, you know, like I've had a few failed crops, you know, and how to dispose some stuff. And it's like, uh, it's a fine line. I mean, the, the biggest thing is testing early, you know, and as a breeder, right. like I, I expect to have some failed and like, I work pretty closely with our ag department, like, you know, the, the director and stuff. So, so I, you know, like I, I know, you know, what, yeah. you know, and again, what, it's the, what, what the steps those loopholes, right. You know, it's like 30 days yeah. before harvest and then yep. it's got the sticks and the leaves in it. But yeah, yeah, when that thing is sold in a jar online or wherever, it's definitely not yeah. that same test. Yeah, I mean, I, I think a huge thing that, you know, that would solve that would be just bumping everything up to 1%. Because I'd say 95% of type threes out there could hit that mark easily. Sure. Um, and then you would just take, you know, that would take all the stress off the farmers. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, the, these farms that are, are converting to THC, it's, you know, it's like I wouldn't recommended i think you know testing early on type three and, and just growing the best flower you can and, and curing it properly is definitely is, is the way to go and you know like you said it, i mean well it, you know i mean genetics are you know like that is the starting material for every farmer so like it's hard you know if you start out with poor genetics you're you know you're you're out the gate at, the, at a disadvantage and you're not going to have a successful crop and so for sure um yeah i mean that's kind of you know that and that's and i see that too and so it's like um you know like i i i have even the past year or two have gone away like i don't sell bulk seed really anymore you know and i've kind of gone on the other route and selling you know small batch uh seed 
Um, right. And now that I've gotten some, you know, pretty good lines, I'm ready to kind of do more production stuff. And, and like I said, I mean, there, I can produce seed, at, you know, if I do a greenhouse run at, at a very low cost versus my indoor seed runs, you know? And so like, for sure. but, but you kind of have to judge the market and be like, is it worth it? You know, is it, is the time right? And, and a part of that is like, I realized, you know, you got to put, put in the time in guarantee that you're able to produce those stable lines that, you know, you can sell to farmers. Right. Um, and in the meantime, I've done, you know, poly hybrid crosses and sold to smaller farmers that are willing to do pheno hunts. So, you know, honestly, the majority of my uh, seed sales are probably home growers, you know, sure, I get, sure. uh, so, um, and so that's kind of where, you know, it, you, but I'm also, yeah, go ahead. Uh, and so your risk to selling to farmers is a lot higher too, because they're going to be a lot more, like we were talking about right. earlier, how the cannabis, the home grower doesn't care. He'll get a seed yeah. and be like, oh, it could have been me. It could have been, but if you sell a thousand seeds to a farmer and, 10% of them are out of whack. You're going to get, you're getting a phone call. And so, right, especially, yeah. yeah, not having to deal with that is definitely a, a benefit. Expect, especially when you're selling to places like in Europe, you know? And so I know I, like, I can tell you, okay, what lines are going to be compliant? You know, like uh, I think some, some state, some countries are at point two, uh, some other countries are at point six, you know? And so it's like, I can kind of guide them and tell you, okay, th these lines will work for you. These don't, don't purchase this line, you know, because I know my, you know, my genetics. And so, right. um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think I have somebody, something for everybody, um, but it, like, you know, nobody's going to come to me and buy 50,000 seeds because I just, that's not sure. like, you know, um, I think, I think eventually like maybe the, the goal is, you know, like ideally I would just breed and, and, uh, and, and kind of focus on breeding because, you know, I'm sure, you know, flower production is a lot of work. And then also sure. I don't wholesale anything. We sell everything direct. So it's like, which, you know, it, by doing so we're, you know, five, we're able to sell, you know, our flower for five times what we could at wholesale price. And so it's like, it just justifies the labor and, and the extra work, but, um, but yeah, it is a lot of work, you know? And, and so, but that's what it takes, man. And, and that, if that's what it takes for me to grow, like the, the genetic, the breeding side of the business, then I will do that for as long as it takes. And in the sure. meantime, becoming more efficient, like, I don't know if you've seen, you know, like I've, uh, we're converting everything over to kind of like a uh, raised bed. You yeah. Know, bigger yeah. I've been style. seeing that. And, your, yeah. Your posts. Yeah. And so it's like, you know, like the, the ability to be able to chop, you know, and, and replant in a day or two versus like, okay, empty pot, you know, like it takes me a week before to empty all my pots, which would be yeah. like three to 400 plants, refill, replant. Um, and so streamlining, which, you know, raised beds do come with their own issues. If you ever are confronted with pests or pathogens, you know, and, and but at, at this point, I don't bring anything in, you know, it's right. like, everything's kind of in-house and it's like, we've already learned those lessons, which sure. is a whole other topic. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, man, I know. I, I think, uh, I don't know if we hit everything. I mean, I think we kind of covered, you know, is, <laughs> I, so I, I had some notes. I haven't been looking. Yeah, I had I had some notes too. Um, how about you, Peter? You got any questions? If he's still in here, I'm still here. I was just uh, queuing up your raised beds. Oh, there you go. Or uh, yeah. the the soil that I assume is going into them, right? Because here you have. Right, so that's uh, that's actually compost. Those those are raised beds. So that's one of my breeding rooms in the back of. Uh, I have a third greenhouse that the front half is used seasonally because, you know, we don't, it's not, uh, there's no heat or lights in there, but, um, so yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's the farm. It's uh, literally, I've been, you know, I, I've had to put everything on pause to start converting everything over, but I've got one greenhouse that's uh, getting ready to go into flower. And, uh, it's, uh, it's, so far I couldn't be happier with the outcome. And, uh, you know, this is all reused soil that's been sitting on my farm, some of it for, you know, a couple of years because nice. initially, initially I wanted to do, like I said, I mean, I think you can go both routes, right? Like you can go, you can cut costs going completely hydroponic and, and doing, you know, minimal inputs that way, or you can kind of go the organic route. Um, and, you know, and, but then there's in between, like I, I was growing organically and buying pallets of uh dry amendments and, and uh bottled right. uh you know caught like teas and it's like right. you you know it, that's organic but it's also you're spending you know fulvic acid and like it's just ha what at what point you know does it be, i don't know it, it doesn't make sense right yeah so, well and, and i think that defines my whole 
approach, you know, 15, 20 years ago when I first started, you know, I was managing hydro shops and I was more on the organic standpoint. I would make my own teas and it was more, it was fun. You know, it was this kind of yeah. cool thing you put together. But I think as I've, as I've evolved and more experienced and then again, catering more towards scaling up the commercial side of it, it's more of the mantra of, is less is more. Like I don't use any amendments. I use, I, you know, I make my own fertilizers from scratch and, and I'm not saying it's the best way to do it, but it's definitely for me, it's the most efficient and reliable. It's, it's something I can do and don't, and I can move on to other things. Whereas I think growing in the soil is a, it's an art as well as a science. You really have to be a lot more dialed in as far as your different inputs and there's a lot more variables. So I, I just kind of eliminate those and it kind of helps me get to my ultimate goal. Yeah, no, absolutely, man. I've grown with, you know, dry mineral salts and, and cocoa and, and, and no other additives. And like, you can get uh, great yields and, and, uh, you know, a good, you know, good product, but it, yeah, I mean, like, obviously, yeah, the organic side of things is, is, uh, it is a passion and it, it just makes everything much more enjoyable. It's like, uh, sure. And so like, if I'm out there every day, all day, and if I can cut my labor down and, uh, and just focus on building fertility and, and, uh, and, and ultimately, you know, seeing the expression of, you know, cause I mean, when you're breeding too, I mean, you know, I think a lot of the, you know, people that I might deal with are, are just growing outside in living soil or, you know, just kind of doing, you know, but sure. they're not putting much, much thought into it. Right. I mean, especially if they're, so you get one chance, right. It's like your outdoor season, you're going to throw some plants out. Um, which, you know, speaks to like early season varieties. Right. I mean, I think for outdoor growers, uh, and uh, I think that is the call auto like you're, you're seeing it with, especially within the cannabis industry, the auto flowers take off like bulk yeah. feminized production auto flower lines are potentially the future, especially for like uh, equatorial countries that, you know, that, that can't yeah. run kind of photo <laughs> photo varieties. So, yeah. Or, um, you know, like with Thomas's pink Panther, which is more of a semi auto, you know, we ran yeah. that, we worked it with our night interruption and we, flowered in the middle of winter with no lights and no blackout you know you just work with the genetics you work with you know some things within the plant physiology and you know we were able to run a full run and you know without the the addition of lighting and, and blackout and and so yeah, yeah it's doing things like that and working with the genetics and figuring out what works and what works more efficiently for the farmer really interests me more so than you know the flavor and the flavors i think are always fun but i think yeah. i look a little deeper as like all right what's going to be a plant that just thrives and then that's your base then make yeah. that taste good or whatever but, well yeah. especially if if you're growing you know say you're you're just growing for the resin like you're a resin farmer right it but it, like you don't even it doesn't even need any terpenes if you if it's all right. going into distillate you know and there is a sure. there's a very you know huge market for like just you know full spectrum distillate or just you know can, cannabis oil in general for for all kinds of products. And so, I mean, uh, I think even, you know, like even Oregon CB, I think they had mentioned that with their like CBG, the fact that the resin doesn't want to gum up a combine. Right. And then right. potentially you could take that CBG and it's the precursor and what it, you know, if you had an easy method of converting it to CBD or THC in the lab, you, all you need is to farm CBG. Yeah. It's yeah. And see, that's, you, that's smart breeding too. Cause I've seen CBD gum up combines and it's, it's not, oh, yeah. it's not fun. So yeah, it's something like that. It's like, that's a really cool novel approach that breeding, you know, has so much power to create something more than just cool crosses. I mean, it is a cool cross, but you know, yeah, other than chemotype. Yeah. And I've talked to extractors too. And it's like, obviously it would be easy just to have your target cannabinoid prevalent and copious amounts in your genetics versus taking in, you know, cause yeah, you could grow CBG if, 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 if that made the most sense harvest wise and whatnot, but um, as far as like THCV or CBDV, like rather than converting it, it would just make sense to harvest and process, right? Like the more steps right. that you can cut out, the better. And so I think there's different approaches and we're going to see that evolve. Like I know even within fiber, like we don't, we don't really have maybe like the equipment available in the United States to harvest some of the, you know, really hardy fiber stocks, right. um, you know, so um, we're, we're so far behind. And I think there's, that's where there's a lot of room for breeders on both on the academic side from the home grower and then anybody with a passion. I think if you're just trying to copy what's already out there or like trying to, like you said, chase the next hype, like you, you know, you can potentially, you can do that, but eventually I think people lose interest in something, you know, um, right. and, and well, that's and where. 
Yeah, because yeah. so they'll, they'll leave you just like they left the last breeder to come on. Oh, he's doing this now? Cool. There's no loyalty yeah. in those hype strains. No. No, and it's, you know, yeah, th- there's, there's not and there's no novelty in it either, right? Like right. I, like you said, like anybody can pick up a couple clones and smash them together and you can get good flour that'll yield great and will be pretty and, and smells nice and stuff. But, um, you know, over time, the the stuff that really stands out and I think, you know, it's a testament to some of the clones that have stuck around for is, is like is effect is probably my number one, you know, like when you're yeah. we're breeding, um, even within the hemp realm, like CBD, CBG mixed ratios can get you kind of stoned. Yeah. And they no, can be that's... compliant, you know, yeah, like it, or even just, even just mixing the two. Um, and then the fact that like CBDV is, is a compliant cannabinoid THCV is, is technically compliant if it has compliant THC levels. And so I think there is, you know, which are, you know, have, I mean, anecdotal, you know, kind of efficacy for like dieting or like maybe quitting smoking. And, and so I think there's like, and I mean, so that's, that's the cool point. That's the cool part about cannabis is like, I see that like large scale commercial aspect and like, I already know breeders are going to handle that side. My, my interest is like, okay, getting, you know, these miners and novel cannabinoids out to people that can grow them and use them as medicine, getting, you know, which, you know, cause like I scour the internet and like, you know, last year I ran through like five or six different one-to-one THC v- v varieties. Right. You know, and it was like yeah. basically what, anything that was available on the, on the market. Um, right. and, and like, I think one of them, like, I mean, there, one of them was completely outstanding. It was a tie and, and, it, and it was my favorite by far, but they all, you know, had, you know, differences, some had, you know, pros and cons. And, and, and so it's like, uh, but, but then again, like I, I don't personally as a consumer, like a one-to-one THCV because it, it kind of cancels out any kind of psychoactive effect that the THC has. And I think I've said this before, it's like, it, it does feel a little bit more like a very energetic hemp, um, sure, you know, right. CBD or something. But if you can get that THCV as a minor with some kind of, you know, and, and get your THCV levels up to 15, 20%, Right. You have a very kind of energetic, enjoyable effect that could be uh, not just, you know, like good for daytime use, but also medicinal um, for people that need it. And and so like, I, I'm just, I try and be as, as well-rounded as I possibly can and approach things from like multiple per- perspectives. Um, and and that's sure. kind of the way I approach, you know, versus like, I think there is uh, advantages of a breeder being like super narrow focus. Like I'm going to take this one line and I'm just going to focus on this one. And, and you see there's breeders out there that have just three solid varieties and they're doing just fine. Like they, they, yeah. there is, you know, um, and so, and, and I, and I imagine like there's things that like I'll never reproduce or that don't interest me and they'll just fall by the wayside. And it's like, if you bought them, you bought them and you'll never see them again. And then there's right. other things that that will potentially turn into true breeding lines and you'll or see you, or you hold on to those and then you auction them for <laughs> thousands yeah. of dollars in a few years. Yeah. If you have the name and the clout to do so, which is, <laughs> right. you know, which is silly in and of its of itself. I think, I think, like you said, there, there's advantages to Instagram in, in that, like, uh, you know, and I've, I've learned this myself. Like if you're not posting, you you don't exist almost. Right. You know, yeah. it's like, and I, you have to <laughs> post constantly, you know, there's, there's a time where I was definitely more, more engaged than I am now. And I kind of gave up on for a while trying to figure out what yeah. else, but yeah, that's the thing. It's, you got to be relevant. And in order to be relevant, you have to produce what they want to see. And, and so, yeah, yeah. you kind of have to pander to that a little bit. Um, but that's why I always try to keep my page somewhat a mix of education, but also kind of poking at some of these ideas that are just common knowledge out there. And, and whether or not I agree with it or not, just, bring more discussion kind of like this topic you know of what what is breeding and and there's no right or wrong it's just get everybody on the same page of there is different levels of breeding and it's no disrespect at any tier it's just there's different levels to it and each of those levels creates different outcomes for different groups of people and i think and that's important because i think you bring a reality to to the subject as far as like um you know as you as as like states come online right and, and they're able to legally grow and you see these breeders you know kind of pop up and and it take a stab at it you know and potentially you know maybe they have the goal of like doing it you know for a living or, or whatnot but you you also have to bring them you know back to reality a little bit and say like i mean there is a lot of hurdles there are barriers to entry like it is easy to make seed that that's unquestionable like anybody can do that but if you want to do it 
for a living and have a product that you know like you, that you can stand behind that your the farmers can stand behind or whoever is going to end up with with that that seed i mean because you ultimately want return customers you want people to enjoy the product and you want to get you know you kind of want to capture their interest in, in in what you're working on so that they you know kind of follow along and, and keep up to date and and it, and it doesn't happen overnight you know i think uh it it I, even people like cookies like you don't take into account like maybe the decades or years that they struggled and and, and kind of had to put in the time and it's like yeah they're sure. where they're at you know for a reason and, or anybody um you know like i kind of like i there's quite a few breeders here in my state washington state and uh, like exotic genetics mike you know like uh mm. i used to i used to shop at the same kind of growth store and he used to be known as cadillac mike and now he lam- <laughs> and drives a Lam- lamborghini right it's like <laughs> But, you know, he, he's an OG, like he's probably been growing for decades. And, and it's like, it just, it, nothing happens overnight. And, and right. it takes time for, for you to get your, your genetics out there. And, and for like me, like, I don't have a marketing team. I don't, you know, like my marketing is Instagram. And I didn't even have right. an Instagram before I started breeding. You know, yeah. like I, and like, I think Peter, Peter knows how bad I am at technology. So, it's like, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know. But I, but it, it goes back. It's like if you produce a good product and, and you're honest and you're transparent, and I think if you can, um, you know, and, and the same goes for you. Like it's, you know, you show your grow, you show your processes, you raise issues where, you know, like, you know, like where bro science might kind of chime in. And so I like right. that's why I've always like that's why I kind of you know I wanted you to get on here because like I don't I don't want to have a conversation with somebody that I I agree with everything on. You know, like I want sure. I want to offer different perspectives. And honestly, this is like, yeah, it's a way for also like discussions to kind of hash out your own views. Like sometimes you don't even necessarily know what you think of something until you start talking about it. So, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. And it's been fun. And, you know, for me, like breeding is always, I, I enjoy it as just a fun, like, like I said earlier, I'll take some plants, but then I, I always, so I'm sitting on a few cultivars that it's like, oh, these are really cool, but it's like, I can't sell these. Like I'm not a breeder, but then I'm like, but I have thousands of these plants, plant or seeds. I want other people to try it. So, I mean, I think there's like two that I have on my site that, yeah. And, it, and it's more of like, you know, and there's almost like a disclaimer on them. I mean, like, I, I'm not going to promise anything with these. It's just, this is the lineage. And some of them took me a few years of, you know, hunting out and, but it's more of like, yeah. I've gotten some really cool results and you, you want to share that with other people. But then it's like, am I falling into that same pit of, I'm just a guy smashing plants together and say, here, try these seeds. And, and so, and yeah, and I don't know where that lies with other breeders and, and kind of the idea of that, but it's, yeah, it's just an interesting, and I think breeding is, is so in depth on many different facets, but, but I think anybody that can make something cool, it's, it's an opportunity for somebody else to maybe dig through it. Yeah, dude. I, I honestly, I want to sell yourself short, man. I think that's great that you have, you know, I didn't even realize that you had a couple crosses up there, but like, you know, you have the platform, you have the knowledge, you know what you're doing. And it's like, you know, you're not going to sell something that's like, a, you know, geared towards flower that might, there's a fiber variety or you're not, you know, like if, right, if, right. You, if you knew it had intersex issues, like, I, you, you know, so you have that kind of like integrity already built within your, you know, because I mean, you were, you know, you're a hemp producer, you've been doing that for years, like you've, you've, you've grown out, you know, countless plants, like, and that's, so I think just judging from where your your background is, you already have kind of the, uh, you know, the what the credentials in some way to be like, OK, these may not be, you know, they're I want to grow, you know, or if they're male, female, it's, you know, I mean, obviously a production farm is not going to grow a male, female variety. Um, right, right. Yeah. And so, a lot you know, of these are the, the type twos because that's what I've been chasing. So it's like, oh, man, I'm not yeah. share some of these out there. And, and yeah, we'll see what people and think of them. But- Dude, there's not enough. Go on to most THC seed banks and try and look for type twos. Right. It, you know what I mean? So it's like, so you like I, in that regard, like you're doing a service, you know, because it's like not enough people are smashing together. And I mean, that's ultimately how you get new CBD varieties. You know, that's ultimately yeah. how, you know, it's like, so yeah. And that was, that was my end goal. And I think I touched on that earlier. It's like, I just find these type twos that work well. I'm, I'm just breeding it to get a handful of seeds and I'm storing them. So that eventually you guys like you or Thomas or somebody else that says, Hey, we're looking for some of these stocks. Then at that point, I'm like, yeah, try these, this, this, this could be cool. And it could turn into something beyond where I'm willing to take it. But in the meantime, you know, I get males and I have thousands of females. It's fun to yeah. put some together. Did I, did I trade, I trade seed with, with, 
with breed like home growers all the time like even from around the world like i traded a yeah. dude in nigeria a couple of years ago for nice. some some nigerians that you know it's like that's cool um and or india or you know it's like thailand is you know you just you meet these people on online and it's like halfway across the world like what other time in history could we we do this and right. they're they're not you know they're not commercially breeding they just have access to you know unique gene pools that i i wouldn't and so it's like uh and i and same for me you know it's like i'm, I'm a collector and a breeder and so it's like i've got something that most people might be interested in and right. so you know that and that's and that's where it's like your hobby joins your career in some way like if you can yeah. if you can do what you love and make a living at it i think that that's everybody's dream and it's like it's not like you know like i it, it goes back to the kind of like uh opportunity cost too it's like what is the next best alternative like i have you know like i have a master's degree i could go you know i could go back and get my phd i could go get a job doing something else and, and work you know maybe 40 hours a week or less right. um i don't want to do that like this is what i chose to do like i i work from home i get to see my kids get to put them to bed you know and it's like i got to work on the weekends maybe take a vacation once a year right but it's but i but if you're doing something you enjoy and you're out with your plants i mean that's and i and i think most cannabis breeders cultivators might say the same thing you yeah, know the people that are angry. in it for the long in it for the long term and that's and that's where you get into this is like you know people are passionate about tomatoes and and they're passionate about other other crops whether they're blueberry farmer or something but cannabis is just another realm man it's like yeah. people have a spiritual spiritual yeah. connection to this they have people that you know it's it's cured their cancer it might have a you know they just it, people have different relationships with this plant and and uh and when you when you develop that relationship to the point where like um you're not happy if you're not cultivating or something it's like right. you know you're you're gonna find whatever it takes to, to do it you know so yeah no and it's funny you say that because you know i've said that before it's like there's gardeners out there that really love gardening and stuff but they're not like wearing gardening shirts and listening to gardening music and you know it's yeah, yeah. it's it's a culture that's really and it's not even, you know, some could say, well, it's the intoxicating side of it. that's kind of drawing them. But it's like even, you know, your beer connoisseurs, I don't think, go to the extremes of cannabis guys. It's so, yeah, yeah. which can be good. And then it could be bad. Sometimes you get passion with, a you know, misrepresentation of knowledge or something. You get a lot of heads butting, I think, in this industry and a lot of egos. But oh, for the most part, yeah. yeah, it's a it's it's a pretty cool kind of conglomeration of passion, which which is cool. Yeah. And that's, that's where it's like, it's an endless discussion. You could ask that question. Like, so is, is cannabis breeding too easy to like hundred different people and you're going to get a hundred different answers. And, right. and I think even this conversation will, you know, it'll probably angry some people and, and maybe it'll open some people up to some different ideas. And um, yeah, dude, I, I think, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer or to it. I mean, there's a million different approaches and, uh, and there's, there's so much room too for, new breeders with different uh approaches like a new thing like that i just have learned about within the last maybe year or two is the uh the leaf mutations right so you know you've oh, got yeah. like duck's foot australian right. bastard cannabis the you've got the pinnate uh like type fern leaves freakies or i think something i see yeah the freaks so so yeah. it's like it, it's almost like in some sense it's an ornamental cannabis right? right like but you can also consume it but it's like it looks cool and so like if you have a novel approach and you, you know, it's like there, there's room. Um, right. I think that's the ticket is like finding something that you're interested in and, and, and trying to pave a new path. Right. And uh, yeah. So, but, uh, but yeah, man. Have we Peter? talked long enough? Yeah, I know. I, I, uh, yeah, probably good. I gotta yeah, we... go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, yeah, the sun's finally out to do everything was frozen this morning. So I couldn't like, I couldn't do move compost, soil, nothing. So it, this, this actually worked out. Yeah, we, uh, we have a bunch of questions and I was going to throw some more gas on the fire with this one. <laughs> oh no. Shoot. But, uh, that, that could either, well, let me get through some of the questions, but yeah, this is the, uh, what causes hollow stems uh topic so if you guys oh i i have no idea but I, i'm very curious yeah, look at that. That... people want you guys to keep going but uh all right let, let me get to some of the questions so rotten uh skateboards asked uh let me just cue it up 
So like, what? Uh, hold on, let me. So so you know you guys talk about like reading best practices, and I think if you whether you're pollen chucking or with a little more intent, like have you bothered to send those seeds out to be people in different environments or tested them yourself in different environments to put them through the ringer? So can you talk about? I guess I'll take, chime take, in on. Take, yeah, take this question wherever you want to. Yeah, I'll chime on that. So in traditional breeding or pure breeding, so taking it through different environments is part of the standard breeding. So it's usually the first year you kind of work across and then you back breed it or self self at the second, third, fourth year. And then it's usually when you get to six, seven generations that you'll send that to other farms and, and get other climates. And, and so now a, a true breeding or an IBL will still show phenotypes based on environmental factors. It won't be a genetic trait. But yeah, that's usually the last step in, in commercial lines. So like tomatoes, hops, anything else like that. It's that's the final step. You send it out there. Does it still hold that disease resistance? Does it still, you know, perform the same way? And so and then if it passes that test, then it's, you know, create the variety. And and so, yeah, that's the final tail end of a six, seven, sometimes eight year process to create some of these these inbred lines. Yeah, so. We pri like I primarily uh, grow in greenhouses and, and we have an indoor room that we run everything through. Um, this year, I'm definitely I'm setting up more outdoor space. My first couple of years, I uh, uh, ran some outdoor, but my soil is just the way that uh, uh, my my property is set up. I have like three feet of topsoil and then a clay hard pan. And so if spring rolls around, everything just gets kind of root rot. So we're, we're going to do pots this year and start doing more outdoor testing. But, yeah, we do send. Uh, we, you know, we send them out to other people that can grow, grow outdoors. Um, and then we also work with the universities that grow a lot of our stuff out every year. Um, and they give us feedback. So, um, my prime, like my main mode of testing is greenhouse and, uh, indoor, which is kind of like, especially for some of my, uh, hemp varieties is, is really what, uh, um, they're geared for anyway. So, you know, I'm not doing a lot of big production runs that are geared for out, outdoor farms at this, like the last few years, I've just kind of been focusing on small batch, uh, premium flower varieties that are, you know, primarily being grown indoors and greenhouses. So kind of, that's where I focus my uh, testing on um, at, at this time. But yeah, same, you know, like if I, I do, you know, I, every year I grow some outdoor plants um, and, and, and do some stuff like that, but I'm definitely going to be expanding that this year. Uh, and yeah, I, I, I just want to say like there, uh without you know i think i brought we brought up oregon cb but there there are a ton of other breeders out there like uh that do you know stable production lines i think uh i know like high alpine is one you know doing like f1 photo or you know photo by auto hybrids that a lot of farms are successful with um davis herb farms east fork cultivars uh you know uh, green luster and zoe therapeutics two big breeders uh you know um, that I think a lot of people are happy in, in growing their genetics. I mean, there's, there's countless others. Um, I know, uh, Dogto Farms was, uh, just te texting me a bunch of different farms. I couldn't write them down fast enough, but it's like, they're, you know, if you, if you, it's not that they don't exist, they are out there and, and they do, they're, you know, they're pumping out seed and a lot of them won't, you know, they, they don't sell small amounts. So it's like, they're, they're really just geared towards farmers, you know, whereas like, um, uh, I think even Thomas, it's like the minimum seed pack you can buy is a hundred, hundred count, which, you know, a home grower might do that, but it's still geared towards like the smaller craft side of, of farming. Um, but if you, you know, maybe we can put together a, a comp, you know, completed list of some of the, the bigger hemp seed producers for farmers to use as a resource. Like I know you Colin probably know some, I could probably think of maybe 15 or 20, um, you know, that would be like, okay, if, if I'm a farmer and I want, you know, to buy bulk seed of, of some solid varieties, you know, that would be a good resource, I think. Um, so, yeah, I don't want to, I mean, you know, I don't want to just leave Agreed. Oregon CBD on the table because, right. um, uh, you know, they, they are the big one, but like you said, they have kind of, a lot of farmers have moved away from them because that's all anybody could buy for the last several years. Right. And so, uh, but there are farms doing proper work, a uh, beacon hemp, um, was doing a lot of like auto flower varieties that were, were, were solid. Yeah. Um, so yeah. 
Any more questions, Peter? Uh, yes. Uh, hold on. Oh, sorry. You, you had an easy uh, down the middle uh, hanging slider uh, that you can see. Let me. Favorite uh, two or three cults of ours you liked in the last year? What's in your head stash? Oh, you want me to go first? Yeah, go for it. So one of my favorites that we, we bred was a uh, Fatso by uh, Yeti OG Cross. Like that's probably my go-to type one. Um, it is uh, uh, the Fatso is from Canarado, but it basically just has like some, some really funky GMO uh, profiles. And then it's, you know, it's, it's super potent. Um, I think for like my mixed ratio, like I like these, uh, these original zombie Kush F2s that, that I've been kind of hunting through. There's a mixture of chemotypes, like there's CBD dominance, there's CBG, and then you get some mixed ratios in there. And that's the one that I'm really like this year. Um, I haven't even dropped any of the flower I need, you know, it's still sitting in bins, but I've been, uh, sampling that. And then for CBD, um, man, um, one of the ones that I grew out from our, uh, RKD cross that it was, a uh, it's a uh, interstellar, I call it, but it's, uh, the pollen donor was a Remdy Kush diesel and the, uh, the, uh, female was a deep space selection. So it's basically one of my abacus, uh, crosses and, uh, man, people blew blue past abacus but that's still one of like it's yeah, i love so many awesome posts <laughs> i loved growing yeah. your deep space remember that red just deep yeah, red dude. deep space i had that was that gnarly. was wild man that, that was, was like wild. the coolest that was one of the cool like you sh you should have cloned that that would have been like oh yeah talk it, about ornamental you could have bred that in like yeah yeah it looked like deep red crab legs like it was crazy stock yeah but the cool thing with the deep space is it does have some of those earthy fuely kind of like oily profiles that you can tease out and i think with the remedy kush diesel in there um you get that and uh it's a heavy yielder uh they're pr they're uniform pretty uniform i mean you get some variability in like maybe bud size but dense so that you can mix the phenotypes and, and sell you know sell good flower smokable flower and, and then the profiles are you know fairly um, similar across the board with that kind of earthy musky kind of funk coming from uh and i i might even have a little bit left on the store um but uh but yeah those are those would be my top three: a CBD, a mixed ratio, and and, uh, and my THC dominant. Yeah, I guess my my top mm -hmm. two CBD, anyways, from this last crop would probably be. I really like the cake berry that uh, Oregon oh, CBD yeah. did. That has such a unique kind of sweet flavor to it. Curious. I'm curious. I was curious about that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a big fan of that. Like just just really nice sweet flavor, and then it grew pretty well. The buds were a little airy, but. I mean, it made up for kind of that terpene. And then the other big one that really stood out was Orange Julius from the hemp mine, Dr. Justice, oh, yeah. Allison's kind of crosses. She sent me some clones. That's one of those, you know, you get a lot of these cultivars that you, you put names on it and you like, ah, I kind of get the strawberries or, ah. but with this one is Orange Julius. Like it smelled like fresh oranges. Like it was undeniable. You could open a bag up to any non cannabis person. They'd be like, man, that smells like oranges. So that was a big standout. I think from this, this last run anyways. That's cool. I'll have to check that one out. Yeah. She's got a handful of good stuff that we grew. I'm not the best at keeping clones alive. So <laughs> I kind of lost yeah. a few cause she shipped unrooted clones. So that was an interesting, oh, interesting yeah. process, so, yeah. but yeah, yeah, they can, you know, the unrooted clones handle the shipping process a little better, but yeah. Then once you get them, you gotta, you gotta root them. So. Yeah, and, and I'm not, I'm admittedly not the best at clones. So even having a little less vigor than they normally would coming right off a plant, I, I struggled a little. Because again, I'm a seed which, guy. <laughs> I don't do clones yeah, very which, often. So. Yeah, which I mean, you know, that, that's another thing. If you can cut out the cost of keeping moms and taking clones, I mean, that's right. huge for a, for a big operation. So. Right. <clears throat> Any more, Peter? I wonder if. But yeah, no, that's, I mean, pretty much I haven't, like the last couple of phenol hunts have been mostly my own own stuff, but the next one I've got a bunch of different different stuff going. So I'm kind of excited. It's always exciting seeing stuff that's not yours because you already like right. with your own stuff, you already kind of 
know what to anticipate. Uh, right. but, but yeah. Sorry, when you asked if there are any more questions, I was uh, like behind this row of shelving. Oh, you're good. Uh, so here's a CBG question. If it mimics an endogenous one, uh, I'll let you take that one, Floyd. <laughs> I, was I, say, I think we need a uh, medical. Yeah, honestly, I have, I have no idea. All like all I know with CBG has been uh, anecdotal, and and some people don't like it, and then the people that do like it love it. I do know that we've had uh, a lot of success with treating Crohn's with uh, CBG. And like, you know, sometimes people don't like CBG on its own, but I can tell you if you mix it with like a one-to-one -one CBD or one-to-one -one THC, it becomes a lot more enjoyable. And, uh, and, and I think, you know, I don't know. I, I don't think enough people have kind of played around with it, but if, and I, and I've said this before, if you've got gut issues, any kind of gut issues, try CBG. And I, and I would try it consistently like three times a day for at least a month before you throw in the towel. And then also make sure that you're getting a potent product, you know, like, uh, like we cram, you know, over, you know, it's like three and a half, four, four grams of, uh, of distillate into a one ounce tincture bottle. So, you know, you're, you're basically guaranteed 3000 milligrams of total active cannabinoids. But I, I find that a one-to-one -one CBD CBG is tolerated by most people. And, uh, and it's, it's great. It, CBG is great for energy in general. Um, but like, but yeah, you know, you know, I'm not a doctor, but I, I've just, you know, I've, I've seen it change enough people and help enough people that that's kind of the, the message that I get out there. So, yeah. And it'll, and honestly, gut issues nowadays, like, I don't know how many people have, you know, I, I know that have had colon cancer, um, that deal with IBS that deal with some form of Crohn's and it's, you know, it's just because no matter how clean our diet is, it's, you know, there's, there's toxins in our water and our food. I mean, it's, it's everywhere, you know, so in our air. So it's like, you can't, can't get away from it. Yeah, just CBC. Really, here's someone with uh, who does have gut issues. Yep. CBC and CBD with CBG. Yeah, CBC. Yeah, CBC is. Uh, you know, I don't know a lot about it, but I do know, like, especially because, like, you know, we also sell like raw distillate for folks that want to uh, to formulate their own products, and just adding a little bit of CBC prevents the crystallization of CBD, and so in in, in that way, it's kind of more of a you know, it's more functional, but it's, you know, and I know people use it in carts um, to keep the viscosity, but yeah, I'd be curious to know if people that have, you know, kind of experimented with CBC and, and what that might uh, help with. And then what was the last, oh, CBN. Yeah. CBN is great. Like as far as like, there's one product that would be, might be considered a, uh, you know, an isomer or something that they, you know, that they make and that would be CBN. And, and I find that it's like, it's amazing for kind of sleep, uh, muscle relaxation and stuff like that. I mean, it, you know, and, and like this plant is so subjective that you got to just, you know, you got to experiment with, you know, a lot of this stuff on your own, but, but yeah, yeah. CBN is a good one. Even if you get isolate, if you can find isolate and you can mix it into a full spectrum distillate, that's what I would recommend. So you're getting the full entourage. So. Is that CBC? Yeah. Yep. CB2 receptor agonist. Yeah, that's a good, good, uh, good rabbit hole to go down. I'll check it out. Uh, too tossy because uh, it was what? Too hot? Is that what they said? It was too sticky. Uh, too sticky. So did they do that? Yeah, I mean, so. One, if you're trying to, if you're trying to like uh, get people on board to cannabis that have never tried it, MCT tinctures or olive oil tinctures are in, and just a tincture in general, something that they could take sublingually is going to be your best bet. Most people are, you know, like if you've never, if you're not a smoker, you're not going to smoke cannabis and even getting somebody to vape something is, can be hard enough. So uh, tinctures are your go-to. Um, you know, I, I find that most, most of like, uh, most folks are, are, are a little less hesitant to try a tincture. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd, say I'd second that. Our tinctures and our candy are some of our best sellers yep. for kind of yeah, the, the non consumers. 
Yeah, gummies too, I think are, are awesome if you can get the, the dosage right. Um, I, I, I like tinctures just because like it's no sugar, no nothing. But like, yeah, if some people, some people don't like the flavor of, of the raw cannabis oil health stuff. Gummies, gummies or capsules. Rosin capsules so, are great. So before uh, we let you guys go, people did not want you to oh. be able to sneak out of the hollow stem question. So let's, let's throw this up there and why don't you walk us through? Cause you, you, this is both observational and research, correct? Yeah. So, and this is kind of the totaling that line of bro science. I think there's a camp out there that is convinced this is like a boron. It's a nutrient based issue. And, and I followed up with those people and there's no data to really back it up. It's a lot of anecdotal. And so when you're dealing with anecdotal with different phenos and climates, there's so much that can go on. And so we've taken, you know, a, a quick kind of research in our crop last round. And we basically set the standard for, we're going to give this plant, you know, all the boron. And we're basically trying and solve the hollow stem issue by doing the things that, you know, the the pro boron people are saying so you know with the boron and the calcium ratios we we messed with those and tweaked those and and no matter what we could do we couldn't mimic the results and that's the epitome of what research and science is you have to be able to make a claim then you have to back it up with results and then you have to be able to let other people mimic those results and so that's something that we just haven't been able to do we've never been able to replicate it i've talked to a lot of other people that different or growers at different universities, they haven't been able to replicate it. So it, it's one of those things where I'm not going to say 100% that has no relation to boron. It may have some play into it. Um, but so my takeaway from this is it's it's mostly a genetic thing. We see it in certain genetics per, very predictably, and we don't see it in other genetics, regardless of you know boron levels and, and things we throw at it. And then there's another, you know, the thing a lot of people tend to skip over this whole idea of is, you know, they, they put a lot of effort into let's pack it full of boron with, you know, with crazy PPM levels. And and I kind of think they negate, you know, the why. Hollow stems, at least from what we've seen in our greenhouse, and, you know, we run up to 2,000 plants at a time. So we see enough replicates to make it significant. We don't see any, any, uh, I guess, decline in health from the hollow stem plants. It's, we yeah. don't see any less vigor. We don't see any issues with it. And some people say, well, it doesn't clone as easily. I've cloned, you know, hollow stem plants. But again, if you're cloning, maybe that does present some issues, but usually you see the hollow pith on the main stem, not so yeah. much on the axillary stems. And most people aren't cloning the main stems anyway. So it kind of negates that, but it's another one of those kind of it goes around and it's got a group of core followers that believe it and, you know, without a doubt. And there's, there's little, little to back it up. So we did a quick trial to say, Hey, these are our numbers. These are our plant analysis. This is what we gave it. We cannot replicate it. And then we kind of throw it out to the community be like, Hey, somebody else replicate it. So yeah, it's a hot topic, but yeah, I mean, I guess I just put the data out there and say, Hey, this is what I've experienced. Well, so it's Honestly, interesting kind of the, the, and I'll let you go first, but I, we can get to some of the comments like this is cutting edge solutions and uh, talking about Rob Clark, but go ahead, Floyd. Oh, I was just going to say, like, I've seen it, you know, like I, I see it often when I'm running from seed, but like, I don't even know if I could think of a clone run that has a hollow state. Like, I think once you take a cutting, I'd be hard, you know, I don't know. I guess I haven't really paid much attention, but like, I've got some plants out there now that are just massive that you could probably cut it in half and stick your thumb in the stem so right uh and the plant is as healthy as could be so um but you can feel it right like you can you can kind of grab that stem and kind of feel around it and you know it's hollow in there and then as you go down the base it gets you know a little more dense um so so yeah, yeah. i mean it's and you know and some people talk about like pitholysis and all these different things but they don't really relate to what we're seeing. And, th and that's the hard thing. It's like, there's, there's small truths into everything. There's so many variables in plant science that it's like a small grain of truth can get exploded into, you know, something that somebody kind of is like, Hey, this is, this is how it is. And it's like, I think this is just a genetic, it's a genetic thing that can be influenced right. by phenotypical reactions in whatever climate you're growing in. Um, 
but you know until somebody really focuses and wants to like make their phd thesis on this i think it kind of stands as and you talk to traditional ag again there's not a lot of research out there on it because it's one of those things where it's like why are we going to chase this it's not detrimental to the plant and in you know in in the case that let's say boron does solve this problem and so you're I mean, it was like 10 times the amount of boron you would apply at it. And, it, you know, my question would be, why would you do that? Just save yourself the money on boron and just let it be its hollow self. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I, don't, I haven't noticed any detriment. So I've never really given it much attention or thought. So. Oh, that yeah, makes sense. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. Because they're a lot easier to break down. So when they do the decorification, they are a lot easier to split the pith apart and there really isn't much there and and so yeah at one point and i think i pointed this out somewhere in that stream of comments is is yeah, yeah they were breeding for that on purpose to create an easier production so the fact that there was a genetic link to it again kind of shades light on the fact that this is probably just genetics oh interesting that's golden coast yeah yeah like i have yeah that that's wild more psychoactive dense stems best used for textiles yeah interesting i mean i could see that like why you'd want to breed that out especially for if you're growing fiber i mean you know half of your plant is you know is not there so yeah that's yeah fascinating it's probably something i should look into <clears throat> so why don't uh we can show some mercy on you guys you're two hours in you want to we can come back and hit we can just scroll through your instagram and see what contentious topics uh we want to hit <laughs> oh. is this a good uh two hours is that a good uh end point for today yeah Floyd, I think, do you have I mean, another two hours in you Dude, no, I, I, I'm, I think two two hours is a good time slot. I think that that's probably you know I think we covered a lot. I mean, dude, I would love to do it again though. I mean, we could we could cover you know, um, really anything. I think, I think. Okay, uh, so yeah. in the chat, would you guys like to see these guys chop it up again uh, on a recurring basis? We got a. Or were we too uh, too boring? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think my next yes. my next controversial topic. I've, I'm trying to put some little more data behind it before I put it out there, but I want to talk about how plants praying up is not a good thing, which I think that's gonna Ooh. ruffle some feathers. Oh in the yeah. So, but I'd love to talk about that. Yeah, we interesting. Got, we got one vote of no confidence, but we got a whole lot of uh, <laughs> <laughs> no. To be fair, yeah, we, we got a whole lot. Yeah, yeah. I want to just just show all the positives. There you go. You got to yeah. take yeah, you, take this out with the sweet. <laughs> yeah, you got to keep yeah. it real. Yeah. And look at that. We even got an all caps. There we go. The chat's always talking in all caps. Yeah, and I mean. Even getting some, you know, getting some other perspectives on here too. I think. I mean, you can cover a lot of ground with two people. I mean, it's you know, so. <laughs> this is uh, so in. Um, I don't know if any anyone with kids has or or not kids if you watch this movie, but the uh, emoji movie. Oh yeah. Yeah, the, uh, the emoji that's uh, meh. This is the, <laughs> this <laughs> is the meh emoji. <laughs> why not all right well on behalf of the uh 200 and something people who are currently watching oh and i'd love if you uh by the way as another public service announcement uh because it was asked again in the chat this is not the same crop king as the crop king seed right. company and as i said in the chat it's like the dude in office space whose name happens to also be michael bolton right and then some asshole named Michael Bolton makes shitty music. And I know. I just need to make like a beanie, stuff. not them. Yeah, not cropping. Yeah. yeah, not not cropping seeds. Yeah. Right. Um. Yeah, and and if you want to, I mean, actually, I'm giving out a lot of seeds right now. If you ever want to send seeds in for me to give out to people, I, I give out a lot of Floyd seeds. Uh. I yeah, know, I could I could send some like uh, Brussels sprouts where I try. I'm like. You want to grow the hypey shit, but here's some high CBG type three <laughs> <laughs> stuff. 
stuff yeah, I'll have to a, explore soon. I'm, that's that's one of my goals in February. We're gonna get you all restocked uh, with a bunch of THCV rich stuff, and then uh, and then restock the CBD, CBG. I'll have a bunch of freebies and stuff too. So yeah, no, I, I I'd say I think you're you know besides you and then a regenerative uh, Dutch blooms up there in Bellingham. I think you're the only two that really stock my seeds, other than than our our personal website. So I appreciate that. But no, I I love what you guys do, uh, Peter, with the with the Future Cannabis Project and and Dog of Love, like. I, yeah, I'll, I'll support you, you know, as long as I can, man. I think this is a not crap thing. <laughs> yeah. Difference. So, all right. With that, uh, and I think if I remember, we got some worm conversations coming up tomorrow, right? Rotten. And then we have some psychedelic conversations and DP still lingering. And, uh, Oh, nice. there he is. Do we have a psychedelic conversation? Let me actually just quickly throw. Uh, yeah, it's gonna people are like, where is that happening? Tomorrow, at 8 p.m. <laughs> Eastern time over on the uh, Psychonauts TV um, YouTube channel that Peter created. So and... if you're interested, just go sub click on that link and subscribe. And because uh, yep. that's where all the. Not just psilocybin, but other, uh, I guess, cannabis is also mind uh, Other mind Dude, wow. if you, oh my if God, you, if you, if you take, uh, if you take high enough doses of RSO, you can definitely have a, have a psychedelic trip for sure. <laughs> that, that's, <laughs> yeah, you're right. Yeah, percent <laughs> man. Anything over like a, a gram and a half, two grams. Yeah. You're, you're getting in that realm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, sure. yeah. Uh, so Gorski, you you didn't necessarily need to take uh, all of them. Or no, sorry, those point two fives were a little bit more. What? <laughs> well, how many did you take? Did you take all of them? Because okay. yeah. all, all of them was a hero dose. All of them was four grams. Yeah, he, he took total. twenty of twenty of the point two five. Now. <laughs> uh i would be interested. even point five on on some. Some people are a little bit more, uh, and depending what you eat as well oh, like dude. kick in yeah. the psilocin a little bit faster and harder on you uh yeah vitamin c or something yeah no if you empty stomach yeah no i've, I've had some yeah on, on low doses yeah yeah i've gone to work and i'm like oh whoop, this is not a micro that's for sure yeah. <laughs> yeah. oops <laughs> yeah so, so gorgeous i took one of them what okay so only one pill that'd be 0.25 Depending okay on yeah you can work your way up to two, two pills. That'd go. be half, half of one gram. For sure. Yeah, I'm psyched to explore uh, all sorts of different strains of psilocybin. Yeah, dude, that's the next. Tomorrow. That's the next big one, right? The next big wave. Yeah, but just to kind of see how different, so like, like I had, you know, for me and, you know, again, it's different people have different reactions and like different things. So for me, uh, I like the albino penis envy. I like the albino golden teacher. Uh, the, for micro? For micro dosing? Or just for in general? Both. Yeah, I, 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 I was doing all different dosing sizes and, uh, but the like, for example, for me personally, the uh, Thai elephant dung uh, kind of just made me sleepy, or just like, like almost like a diesel, like a slow diesel engine. Um, <laughs> but I did. I don't think I tried that one at like three or four grams, because also taking them as little capsules, it's like. It's like yeah. they all get stuck in your throat. So I'd like to, I'd rather have extracted a uh, product nice. eventually like little chocolate bars. Oh yeah. Chocolates are, yeah. Chocolates are, are easy. These are great. What do you got there? Little, uh, it's just a ground up gram of oh. uh, albino penis envy. Just mix so, it in a drink. Yeah. Throw it in some, uh, like some lemon, lemon juice. And it'll yep. kick it in super quick, super harder. It's not going to be a uh, six-hour event for you. You know, you should be able yeah. to snap back in four or five hours. Um, yeah, I think grinding rough. it up is is essential, right? I mean, yeah, makes it a little easier. That's the digest. 
That's cool, though. I think that'll be an interesting conversation. Who you guys got ha- having on for that? We have uh, Tanazi uh, from Sacred Three Mushrooms. He's uh, sponsoring it and um, guiding us through uh, home cultivation, you know, the basics oh, cool. of starting a kit and stuff like that. So tomorrow we'll actually be inoculating our own grain. Um, we have nice. a kit over there on Daga.Garden that people are available to go grab and uh, join along with us. Uh, cool. Green Table Gardens. He's huge in our chat. He's not big on uh, Instagram or anything, which I respect highly. Uh, yeah. He's going to be there guiding us as well. He's he's a pretty accomplished mycologist, as, so obviously, yeah, we're excited. Cool, man. Yeah, that's that's super cool. Yeah. All right, on. Yeah, no, I, I think that would be even fun too. Like, yeah, I think tutorials and stuff like that. I mean, just getting information out. I mean, that's the cool thing about this platform is like, I mean, the knowledge that you guys are spreading is pretty sweet. So, for sure. Um, but yeah, guys, it was it was fucking awesome. It was uh, appreciate yeah, you know your time, uh, Colin and dude. Yeah, I, absolutely. Any any time. And and I thought I saw you mention you guys might be starting a podcast or you might be starting a podcast too. Is that happening still? Or yeah, we're toying around with it just because, like I said, I took winter off. The greenhouse is empty the first time in ten years, so I have oh, this kind of be nice. this free right time. Here. Right. Well, hey, yeah. We, we come with an audience, dude. That's that's what I'm saying. Like I, I like I, I kind of thought idea. about the idea too, and it's like the fact that you know the infrastructure is here, the audience is here, and then it just you know that uh, yeah, it's a it's an yeah. awesome community. So yeah, and, you know, and I think the conversation, at least that I have in mind, would be kind of like what today was. You know, just bring yeah. some experience and try and bring some of the science in it without it sounding like a lecture. You know, have a yeah. little little more anecdote, but. Yeah. Well, and that's right, dude. I, I can like I can always use more science. Like you know, I'm I'm more like I've kind of learned just by trial and error and figured out what works. And it's uh, you know, and so but like any time you can layer on, you know, the the you know kind of like you said the science or the the deeper understanding behind it, um, For it's sure. just more you know more knowledge. So um, yeah, and yeah, I hope yeah I hope you know like I try not to be just surface level and everything. Like hopefully we got you know, we peeled back some, some layers and kind of got deeper on, on certain topics, but, um, I mean, it, you know, that, that is an open-ended question. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. And a lot of this is just opinions and yeah, and exactly. kind of based on experience and where we come from, there's a, obviously a few things that are mathematical in the sense of there is a right answer, but then a lot of it is, it's very, and, you know, in plant research in general, you know, when, I, when we were working with Mammoth P and creating new formulas and stuff, it, there's so many variables that, Oh yeah it was hard for us to figure out, all right, this consortium of bacteria is doing this. Why? Yeah. Like, is it because of the new, I mean, there's so many, cause even in the greenhouse, we have 10 degree swings. And so, yeah, there's a lot of ambiguity in, in research. And so talking about it and kind of highlighting some of those things is I think super important. Yeah. I think the microbe stuff is, is super interesting. The only thing that I've ever noticed the huge difference is like direct mycorrhizae application to the roots at transplant. Yeah, and that's, sure. you know, if I'm going to spend money on anything, that's, that's what I do. No watering in or anything like that. But, um, but yeah, there's, sure. there's a ton of science behind that, but yeah, no, that's, that's fascinating. So it all, it's all interesting, but all right, guys, cool. I think I'm going to peace out. It was a good conversation. Hopefully right. everybody else enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, I mean, if, if you can find us at a, you know, I'm on Instagram at Hoku Seed Co. And then just our website, Hoku and then Peter, Peter's going to have a bunch of new gear here shortly up on uh, Dog of Love. So. Cool. Colin, yeah. And I guess you can at- find me at Instagram, Crop King Colin, or and then all the flour that we we sell and release, all the CBD products are Neverwinter Botanicals. Cool. All right, guys. You guys have a good rest of your day, man. Cool. I'll, I'll talk to you guys later. Thanks, everyone. All right. See you guys. I will kill that broadcast.